Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, and we'd like to thank you for joining us um, and welcome to NHF's third annual Victor Griffiths War Medical Symposium, Active Research in Women with Blood Disorders, generously brought to you by a partnership with Griffiths. This year's NHF Victor Griffiths War Medical Symposium will focus on current research in women with inherited blood disorders. We have brought together an impressive lineup of clinical clinician researchers who have each initiated projects aimed at improving or understanding of women with inherited, inherited blood disorders. This symposium poses an incredible opportunity to review the quality research projects occurring across the US, but also raise a few of the research questions that remain unanswered in advancing treatment and management for women with inherited blood, blood conditions. With me today is Emma Hatcher, who is the head of patient affairs at Griffles, who I'd like to invite up to say a few words, Emma. Thank you, Brett, and good afternoon from a very hot and humid Washington, D.C., and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Griffles has been a proud, long-standing partner to NHF, including through the support of this symposium named in honor of Victor Griffles Rora. And though I'm not new to Griffles, I'm new to this role at the helm of our patient affairs team, uh, actually as of January of this year, and it's been an absolute privilege getting to know and work with the leadership and staff of NHF. Um, even though the use of plasma-derived therapies is on the decline, clotting factor still remains critically important for patients around the world. Uh, this year, we extended our contract with the World Federation of Hemophilia's Humanitarian Aid Program and pledged to contribute 240 million IUs of clotting factor through 2030. So in brief, we re remain very much committed to the hemophilia community and look forward to continuing our partnership and collaboration with the NHF. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Emma. I'd, I'd like to just take a minute to thank you and Griffles uh, for your continued commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Um, your unwavering support certainly doesn't go unnoticed and we appreciate all you do for NHF and the community at large. So thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. It's our privilege. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the planners for this year's medical track, um, Dr. Stephen Pipe, Dr. Christopher Walsh, and Dr. Stacey Crittell and especially Dr. Mira Chitler, of course, who has been instrumental in bringing these excellent speakers and this symposium on active research in women with blood disorders together. Um, and aside from her work to help plan this year's medical track, um, Dr. Chitler is a professor of pediatrics at Central Michigan University College of Medicine and the Barnhart Lusher Hemostasis Researcher, Research Endowed Chair at Wayne State University. She is director of both the Hemophilia Treatment Center and the Jean M. Washer Special Coagulation Laboratory at Children's Hospital of Michigan. That Dr. Chitler completed her medical training in India and went on to do her residency in pediatrics and received fellowship training in pediatric hematology oncology in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Chitler is a member of NHS Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, MASAC, and chair elect of the Learning Action Network of the Women and Girls with Blood Disorders Foundation. She has published over 70 publications and 10 book chapters. Her research interest is in global hemostasis assays, particularly thromboelastography and thrombogeneration. She is currently an internationally recognized expert in thromboelastography and has written the guidelines for performing thromboelastography in, in, in hemophilia. Dr. Chitler, it's always good to see you, uh, though I, I look forward to next year to seeing you in person. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Brett, for the very kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the National Hemophilia Foundation's third annual Griffiths Rora Medical Pre-Conference Symposium. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to organize this wonderful session on active research in women and girls with blood disorders. And uh, today, our focus will be on the research and work in the field of bleeding disorders in females which has unfortunately not received its due importance in the scientific community, but that is slowly changing. While we would have loved to meet all of you and interact in person, this unprecedented pandemic has changed things for us, but we are grateful that technology allows us to be able to continue to meet at least virtually. Uh... Trying to advance my slides. There you go. Okay. So our agenda today is packed with some excellent presentations by researchers who have done and are doing some really important work to better understand bleeding disorders in females and also what we need to do to progress in the field. 
Before I introduce our exceptional faculty, I just want to highlight how you will be able to participate in today's virtual symposium. Each session will be followed by a Q&A and there's a chat box located on the right side of the screen and that'll be running for the duration of the symposium. Please feel free to communicate through the chat box and post your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. If we are not able to get to all the questions, NHF will be sure to share your questions with the speakers and reply to you afterwards if you can identify yourself. As you can see, the lineup of speakers and topics is timely and thought provoking, and we hope that this session will throw light on the issues in women's health in females with bleeding disorders and encourage more providers to pursue research in this population. So bleeding disorders have for decades been synonymous with hemophilia. So if you're not a male with hemophilia, the likelihood that you would be recognized as a patient with bleeding disorder was low. And that's not to minimize the issues that people with hemophilia have to face, but it's important to recognize that there are other bleeding disorders and that women have symptoms that may be different in severity or location compared to men. But I think first we need to recognize the extent of the problem. We have to recognize the type of symptoms that women experience and be cognizant of the effects of these symptoms that uh, they have on their quality of life. We also need to appreciate the importance of raising awareness of the issues that women with bleeding disorders experience amongst the providers of the medical community in order to ensure that we are able to do the necessary research and to help manage this population better. So in the last decade, there's been a significant change with many articles supporting the need for establishment of better care and guidelines for women and girls with bleeding disorders. And as such, uh, there have been many publications and initiatives to facilitate the diagnosis and management of this population. National and international organizations have stepped up to promote research and education regarding women and girls with bleeding disorders. And here we are today to look at some important work that is happening at the Learning Action Network of the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, where researchers are focused on trying to gain a better understanding of the pathophysiology of bleeding in females, and also establish better treatments for managing the bleeding symptoms that women with bleeding disorders experience. So as I mentioned previously, we have an excellent lineup of speakers. Please stay with us to learn about some very important work in women and girls with bleeding disorders. We hope to see a lot of questions for the speakers to stimulate them to continue this very important work that they're doing. So without much ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker will be Dr. Paula James, who will kick off the session today by giving us an overview of the current landscape of research in women with bleeding disorders. Dr. James graduated from the University of Saskatchewan and is now a professor in the Department of Medicine at Queen's University. She holds cross appointments to the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine and Pediatrics. She's the medical director of the Inherited Bleeding Disorders Clinic of Southwest Ontario and its Aligned Women and Bleeding Disorders Clinic. Dr. James is a clinical scientist with an active research program focused on the molecular genetic basis of inherited bleeding disorders and the clinical impact of these conditions. She's published over 130 papers in her field and holds and has held multiple national and international leadership roles, including clinical co-chair of the 2021 ASH, ISTH, NHF, WFH, One Willebrand Disease Guideline Diagnosis Panel. Thank you so much, Dr. James, for being here today and I will let you take over now. Thanks so much, Dr. Chitler. I'm gonna share my screen. Is that working okay now? Can you see my slides? Yep, that sounds good. Okay, great. So thank you so much. It's really an honor um, and a privilege to be here presenting today um, at the third annual NHF Victor Griffel's Aurora Medical Symposium. It's uh, a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And so I'm very happy to talk to you about the current landscape of research in women with bleeding disorders. 
And so these are my disclosures for this presentation. Uh, I have research funding currently from Takeda, CSL Bearing, and Bayer. So my plan for this presentation is outlined on this screen. Uh, I'm gonna talk initially about the clinical problem. You've already heard Dr. Chitler start, start to set the stage for why we need to be focused on this issue. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some comparisons of the research and resources that have been dedicated to women with bleeding disorders, touch on projects that are focused on women and bleeding disorders, and then give you some of my thoughts for what the future priorities should be and how as a community we should strive to continue advancing this area. So to start with the problem, uh, there's a book uh, that you can see on the screen here called Invisible Women, uh, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. This is an excellent book for anyone who cares about these kinds of issues, written by Carolyn Creato Perez. And in this book, she talks about problems facing women in the workplace, in society in general, and also in the healthcare system. And she talks about the fact that for years, medical education has focused on a male norm and that everything that falls out of outside of that has been designated as atypical or even abnormal and so when i was in medical school we were taught about the 70 kilo man um, and that was what all of our understanding of physiology was dependent on we were taught symptoms uh, through an understanding of how they are experienced by men. Reference ranges were often and are often still determined on men. Historically, treatment studies have focused primarily on men, excluding women of childbearing potential, excluding women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. And the consequences of this can be seen in many examples of disease. Let's take, for example, coronary artery disease. Women's symptoms of MI are considered atypical. We've all heard that, that women present with atypical chest pain. That leads to delays in women seeking medical attention because they don't recognize that their symptoms might be related to an MI. Troponin reference ranges were determined based on populations of males. And so there are delays in diagnosis. There are delays in getting women to the cath lab. There are delays in stents or angioplasties or revascularization procedures. And so all of this results in poorer outcomes for women. And if we focus ourselves on the topic at hand today, which is bleeding disorders, and take a look at the global prevalence of these conditions, we know that the WFH estimates that one in a thousand individuals worldwide is affected with a bleeding disorder. And so for those of you in the United States, that means that there are over 320,000 affected Americans. In Canada, it means we have nearly 38,000 affected Canadians. And yet if we look at registries of diagnosed individuals, the numbers are much, much smaller. And so in Canada, we have 8,000 individuals registered with a bleeding disorder. And I think what that speaks to is the fact that many go undiagnosed and it's not a stretch to think that the majority of those are women. There's no question if a boy or young man presents with a joint bleed that that's abnormal, but there are many barriers facing diagnosis in women that lead to them being unrecognized. So I've got a few of those barriers listed on this slide. I think there really historically has been a lack of understanding of normal versus abnormal bleeding, particularly when it comes to menses and the postpartum period. There are stigmas against open discussion about that kind of bleeding. And there has historically been a lack of research, resources, and tools. And one of the things that's just quite truly a challenge here is that a certain amount of bleeding in women is normal. 
that men sees and bleeding postpartum is normal. And so how do we evaluate that bleeding and how do we determine when it becomes more than would be expected and in need of further investigation or management? I think unintentionally as well, some of the things that have been done in terms of disease classification and nomenclature have been barriers and have been to the detriment of women with bleeding disorders. And I'm gonna talk about some of those and then talk about efforts that have been undertaken to address those barriers and all of these barriers. So if we look at VWD diagnosis, for example, and this is some data from the CDC, males who are affected primarily are diagnosed before the age of 10. So 76% are diagnosed by the age of 10. For females, only about half are diagnosed by the age of 12. So there, you can already start to see that, that disparity. It's a very recent nice publication that looked at this in um, more detail. And so on this slide, I've got the age of first bleed in panel A with years across the x-axis. And you can see that both for women in red and men in blue, the majority of bleeding symptoms start in childhood or adolescence or early adulthood. And there's no difference between women and men. However, if you look at the age of diagnosis, it's significantly different with about 50% of men being diagnosed in childhood, but 50% of women needing to wait until they're in their 20s to be diagnosed. And so this diagnostic delay in panel C for women is 10 to 20 years. Uh, and it's just unnecessary and too long um, for women to be suffering with bleeding symptoms without appropriate diagnosis and medical attention. In that same paper um, published recently, they took a look at the bleeding phenotype of men and women with autosomally inherited bleeding disorders. And so in each of these panels, you can see von Willebrand's disease type one, two, and three, rare coagulation factor defects, uh, defects of fibrinolysis and congenital platelet disorders. And again, we've got men in blue and women in red. And so if we compare bleeding score in panel A and over on the right, total bleeding score in men versus women, we see that women have higher bleeding scores. And that's to be expected because the bleeding assessment tools that generate bleeding scores include measurement of gynecologic and obstetrical bleeding. Interestingly, if we actually remove those sex specific symptoms in panel B, men actually have higher bleeding scores. But I think the real important piece of information here is in panel C. And so no difference was found in participants in this study between men and women in those who required treatment in the year prior to inclusion in this summer. So men requiring more treatment cannot be implicated as a reason for earlier diagnosis. If we move to think about the situation for hemophilia, it's estimated that for every male with hemophilia, there are 1.5 hemophilia carriers. It's not uncommon that we only realize that a woman is a carrier of hemophilia after she has a son who's been diagnosed with the disease. We know that 30% of carriers have low factor levels, which means that if you looked at a registry, about a third of the individuals with hemophilia should be females. And that's far from the case. And so according to the World Federation of Hemophilia Global Survey published in 2017, only 3.5% of those registered with hemophilia are females. So then you might think, well, perhaps the symptoms that men suffer are worse than women. Maybe that's why they're getting diagnosed sooner. And it turns out that that is also not the case. Um, and so if we look at studies that have addressed quality of life, and there have been a number of studies published now using both quantitative and qualitative methods, data exists that shows that 
women with von Willebrand's disease have a quality of life that is worse in multiple domains than men who are hemophiliac and who are HIV positive. And many studies have shown that this is likely directly related to the burden of heavy menstrual bleeding and iron deficiency. So it's very clear, um, as Dr. Chitler pointed out, that women are suffering from these symptoms. And so I think hopefully it's become clear that delayed or missed diagnosis results in missed treatment opportunities and increased morbidity. So next let's take a look um, at a comparison of research that has been done and is being done and resources dedicated to the field of bleeding disorders. And just before I show this data, I wanna quote the very wise Peter Kuides who uh, published this sentence many years ago uh, in a paper entitled Females with VWD, 72 Years as the Silent Majority. What Dr. Kuides pointed out is that VWD on clinical grounds is primarily a disease of females. And I'm not in any way trying to minimize the importance of symptoms in males who have von Willebrand's disease. But this perspective is the one that I have in mind for the slide that I'm gonna show you next. And so this is some information that Angela Wyand put together in an amazing paper that she wrote last year entitled Sexism in the Management of Bleeding Disorders. It was published in RPTH and I was fortunate enough to be a co-author on this. Please take a look at this paper if this area and this discussion is of interest to you. She did an amazing job with this. What she showed is that if you look at PubMed citations, VWD compared to hemophilia A and hemophilia B, there are far fewer for, for von Willebrand's disease. In terms of studies registered on clintrials.gov, far fewer for VWD. If you look at trials that are completed, there are far fewer. If you look at currently approved products, there are not that many for VWD compared with kind of an explosion of novel therapies that, have, um, that has occurred in the last few years for hemophilia A and hemophilia B. And the global market is vastly different in terms of the amount of money that's spent in looking after patients with these conditions. And again, I'm actually delighted to have the newer treatments to treat my patients with hemophilia, but when von Willebrand's disease is a more common condition, and as we've shown, associated with significant suffering, I think this really is an imbalance. Another recent publication that focused on this was published by Cecile Dedee and Peter Lenting and colleagues from Paris. And they were taking a look at over the years, innovation for the treatment of hemophilia versus von Willebrand disease. And in the beginning, things were pretty similar um, in terms of the pace and the number of advancements that were made. But clearly in recent decades, there have been earlier advances for hemophilia A and more advances for hemophilia A. So uh, to try to not be complete downer on this subject um, and to turn our focus to the things that have been done and where we can go. I'm going to talk a little bit about studies that have focused on women in bleeding disorders and certainly want to acknowledge my co-presenters in this session who are going to show you wonderful examples of the work that they are doing. I will acknowledge that I am biased having spent a significant amount of time in my career working on bleeding assessment tools, but I think the work that's been done on BATS and on bleeding scores has had significant benefit to women. And these tools have been shown to have the best diagnostic accuracy in adult women. Uh, there are many bleeding assessment tools that exist, as you can see on the slide, but many of them have descended from a common ancestor. Um, I, I know many of you are familiar with our self-administered bleeding assessment tool that helps a patient determine if their own bleeding symptoms are normal or abnormal. And in adult women, 
The sensitivity of an abnormal bleeding score for von Willebrand's disease is 100% with a negative predictive value of one. And so in terms of diagnostic accuracy, it's really tough to beat bleeding assessment tools when it comes to the assessment of adult women. In terms of trying to address this problem overall and to make the self fat widely accessible, in March, 2016, we launched a website called Let's Talk Period and made the self fat freely available on that site. When we recently took a look at our data, there have been almost 275,000 page views and we have an aligned um, Facebook account as well that's had over 1.3 million in terms of the reach, which means how often the content has been seen on our Facebook page. Over 30,000 individuals have taken the self bet. And you can see that about 41% of them have abnormal bleeding scores. So we certainly are attracting uh, a group of people who have bleeding symptoms and are looking for help. Um, deciding if their symptoms are, are normal or abnormal. And once you've taken the self bat on the Let's Talk Period website, you get a PDF printout of your results with an interpretation of whether or not your score is normal or abnormal that can be taken along to your um, next medical appointment. Certainly, uh, Let's Talk Period is not the only player in this space. Um, there have been many other projects and efforts launched um, from around the world. Know Your Flow is a, an Irish uh, initiative focused on understanding normal versus abnormal periods. There is a lot of work that's been done by the National Hemophilia Foundation, including the Better You Know website. And I also want to acknowledge the significant efforts of the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. And increasingly, we're seeing scientific meetings that have specific focuses on the issues facing women with bleeding disorders. So Code Rouge is a conference, uh, the third um, iteration of Code Rouge is coming up in a few weeks. This is a Canadian meeting. Um, there have been two global summits from WFH on issues facing women and girls with inherited bleeding disorders. There have been initiatives from the European Hemophilia Consortium and other organizations. And again, I just wanna acknowledge this current symposium. Uh, quite honestly, early in my career, this would not have happened. Uh, I think this kind of an event would have been very unlikely a decade ago. And I think this kind of a focus and this lineup of speakers um, should give us all uh, significant hope and excitement for the future. I do want to specifically talk about the VWD guidelines briefly. Uh, Dr. Chitler mentioned my role as the clinical co-chair for the diagnosis VWD guideline that was published um, at the same time as the management guideline. Uh, these were published both in Blood Advances in January 2021. And something to acknowledge that every diagnostic recommendation we made prioritized not missing affected patients. And as we've already discussed, those are most often women. And so the panel was very committed to making recommendations that would optimize the identification of affected individuals. There were significant, um, a significant number of recommendations focused on issues specific to women, but the panel was also very careful to be sure that any recommendations that were made were inclusive of issues facing women. So for example, the recommendation in favor of prophylaxis in VWD patients with severe and sustained bleeding was entirely intended to apply to patients with heavy menstrual bleeding who have had ineffective management through other strategies. Other treatments, tranexamic acid, combined oral, oral contraceptives um, were also compared and there are recommendations in support of those treatments over desmopressin, for example. And then issues facing women at the time of labor and delivery and in the postpartum period were also addressed. It is very important though to mention that 
for the management recommendations, the panel was unable to make a single strong recommendation. And that's because of a lack of high quality evidence. It's not because of a lack uh, of the panelists' belief in the importance of these treatments. It was entirely because of a lack of high quality evidence. And so part of what we did with these guidelines was to call that out and to flag it for the community as a way of saying we have to do better. We need to focus ourselves on generating higher quality evidence. So I mentioned issues around nomenclature earlier. Um, and I just wanna highlight this effort led by uh, Dr. Robert Sidonio and published by Dr. Karen Van Galen with regards to the terminology we use to talk about carriers of hemophilia. And so this was a joint effort from the factor eight and nine subcommittees of ISTH as, long as, as well as the Women's Health SSC. And this recent, um, th these recommendations were recently published in JTH and you can see the way this breaks down that for a hemophilia carrier with a factor eight or nine level of less than 40%, that individual should be diagnosed as a woman or a girl with hemophilia with the severity, mild, moderate, or severe correlating with the way that we diagnose men with hemophilia. And that for carriers with normal factor levels, we need to really think about whether or not they have abnormal bleeding or not, because we know that carriers, even with normal factor levels can have abnormal bleeding. And so for those individuals, the term symptomatic hemophilia carrier is recommended. So where do I think we need to go from here and what should our future priorities be? I gave this a fair bit of thought um, when I was putting this presentation together and here's kind of a high level summary um, of what I think needs our attention. I think we need to look at patient outcomes depending on diagnostic strategies and thresholds. We need to improve our understanding of the pathophysiology of bleeding, particularly when it comes to gynecologic and obstetric bleeding. We need to focus on prognosis and on the natural history of disease in women of reproductive years, for sure, but we need uh, an increased focus on adolescents and women as they age. Uh, those groups have been very underrepresented um, and we really need to learn more about those groups. We need high quality evidence for treatment. As I mentioned, there wasn't a single strong recommendation that we were able to make in the management guideline for VWD. Kind of alluded to this earlier, but I also think that we need research that is inclusive of women of childbearing potential, women who are pregnant and women who are breastfeeding. And I, I challenge the notion that research cannot safely be done in those patients. Women are entirely capable of deciding for themselves about the risks and benefits of research and giving informed consent, which is the bar that we hold any research participant to. And I understand that there are regulatory issues barring this, but I think one of the things that we learned from the COVID pandemic and issues around COVID vaccination and the outcry um, for data proving safety and efficacy in pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding is that there is a need for this kind of work. I also think we need to continue to work towards novel therapies for the treatment and prevention of bleeds. And so I just wanna go back to this wonderful paper um, published by um, Cecile Denis in Blood recently. Many of you are probably familiar with this um, work. This was based on a plenary lecture that Peter Lenting gave at the Milan ISTH last summer. Um, and so what they highlight is that, you know, here's the current state of the way we treat VWD patients, but here's what's possible. Potential future approaches. There's a lot of exciting things that could be done to improve the treatment of VWD. And there are a number of groups who've picked up on many of these strategies and are doing 
really important and novel work. And I think this needs to be supported and it needs to continue. So a few thoughts on, on where do we go from here? I think there need to be dedicated funding opportunities for people doing research in the field of women of bleeding disorders. We need to continue to leverage our collaborations and our networks. We need more conferences and symposiums like this one, but we have to be careful about representation. And so we need representation of women and other equity seeking groups, people of color on the leadership of people who are making decisions about who's gonna be speaking. Um, we need our speakers to be representative. I think we need increased sessions at other meetings focused on women and bleeding disorders rather than maybe just the one or two sessions out of 15 focused on, on that issue. I would love to see training programs developed that have a specific focus and recognition on issues specific to women's health. I think we need women's research institutes at academic set centers. As I mentioned, I think we need to work towards true informed consent and include pregnant and nursing women in studies as appropriate. And across the board, I think we need an increase in female leadership. So to summarize my thoughts here, um, I, I, I certainly agree with the comments Dr. Chitler made at the beginning that we have seen an increased focus on women in bleeding disorders. We need to keep that going. Um, we need to increase it further and we need to sustain it. And that will only serve to improve the health of our patients. And for any trainees who might be listening, uh, this is an enormous area of opportunity and potential for an academic career. I think the number of questions that need to be asked and answered is enormous. Um, and so any of the speakers today, I'm sure would be happy to hear from you if you have ideas, and myself included, about how to further um, research in women and bleeding disorders. So I just wanna end with this acknowledgement slide, um, acknowledging my Let's Talk period team um, at home here in Kingston. And then this is always a dangerous thing to do. Um, this is not an extensive list, but I also just wanna acknowledge everybody who has inspired me um, and who has led the way in terms of breaking new ground on research for women with bleeding disorders and who continues to do that work today. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I did it properly, that's a shocker. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. James. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, you spoke so well about what we have so far and what needs to be done in the future. And I think that's uh, something so important for us all to remember and to focus on, because like you said, I think unless we persevere and continue to collect data, we will never be able to um, advocate for women who have bleeding disorders. Without data, there is no way we can uh, move forward. And I think that's where I hope that uh, the work we're going to do presenting today will, will also showcase uh, that part. So I do have one question um, here from Dr. Srivats actually. And her question is, when there's evidence that women with coagulation factor eight and nine levels at 40 to 60% also have bleeding, why are we not including them in the definition of mild hemophilia in females? And shouldn't the definition be based on a patient's bleeding signs and symptoms rather than just a factor level? Yeah, such a good question and very insightful, clearly from somebody who understands this very well. We debated that a lot, the people who were involved in that project and who were involved in this publication. and. I have to say that personally, my opinion aligns with yours, that I'm not sure we got it exactly right because of the issue that there is bleeding independent of factor levels in a number of these women. I think partly what we did was informed by the patient community um, and patients saying 
we want to be called the same thing as a man with hemophilia because we want access to factor treatment if we need it as well. And that was a bit of a surprise to me, I have to say, but was something that we certainly heard loud and clear from patients who were engaged in the process. Um, and so I guess I would view this as a first step. Part of the problem I think we've got with hemophilia carriers is that for carriers who have a level of 55% and have abnormal bleeding, we don't completely understand yet why that is. And there's been some work done to try to start to unravel that. But I think maybe some of the hesitation of going the extra step that you're advocating for um, is just that we need more data to understand it better. Like I said, I completely understand your perspective, and they certainly were people, myself included, who voiced that while we were debating. That's wonderful. I have one question about one of the slides that you presented. Um, when you looked at, uh, you know, the males and females that study that looked at the age of presentation and oh. the time of diagnosis, and it, the symptoms appeared to start at the same time. Yeah. But was it um, that the females just didn't go to see the doctor early on, or it, did they go and just got, get ignored? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. The paper didn't specifically look at that. And I suspect that there are a number of reasons why that happens, both of which you just suggested, that maybe they don't go, maybe at home it's not recognized that it's abnormal, or almost worse, they go or are taken and their symptoms are dismissed by the medical community. You know, so this idea about sexism in the healthcare system, it's really significant and baked in. Women's symptoms get discounted. And I think that's been shown across the spectrum of diseases. Uh, women with pain, for example, their symptoms are often minimized compared to men. So I think there's a bunch of reasons for it. Um, and we're gonna have to start to chip away at this from a bunch of angles to fix the problem. I don't think there's gonna be any one strategy because I don't think there's any one, any one problem for why that's happening. That's right. It's also potentially possible that maybe because boys are tend to be more involved in activities that could give, that give you opportunity to bleed. And I think that's one of the big problems we see in the pediatric side is that you just haven't had the opportunity to bleed. And if girls are kept at home and play with dolls and don't do anything active, then I guess you have less of an opportunity to bleed. And that may be some one reason for why girls don't get picked up as, as easily or early on as boys do. That's just an excuse, but that, I, uh, that might be the case. Yeah, I think you're entirely right. Obviously, your, your pediatric perspective on this is, is very welcome and important. And I think, I, I think there's truth in what you're saying. Yeah. So pre I would expect that the symptoms should be very similar, right? Yeah. Yep. Only post I guess, then the big question comes up as to, is menstrual bleeding recognized as a symptom of a bleeding disorder, which I think is the yep. huge problem. Yeah. So I think one of the deficits is cross education amongst physicians, right? We need to educate our ENT physicians to say epistaxis is not normal. And yeah. we need to educate our gynecologists to say that heavy menstrual bleeding is not just hormones. And so I think education across uh, different specialties becomes key to expanding our ability to recognize and uh, treat these patients appropriately. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think one of the other things that's actually very insidious and a good example of systemic sexism is a ferritin reference range, for example. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. So in my hospital, the ferritin reference range goes down to five micrograms per liter, which means that a woman with a ferritin of six does not get flagged as having an abnormal lab test. That's ridiculous. I mean, a woman with a ferritin of six is profoundly iron deficient and in need of supplementation and at risk of becoming anemic if she's not already. And so, you know, it's not, it's, so, it's, 
these systemic things are so multi-layered and I, I have colleagues who I fight with who don't recognize that a ferritin of six is iron deficient um, and in need of some further thought is that because of heavy menstrual bleeding, is this somebody who has an underlying bleeding disorder? I've got a, su a supplement iron, but I also have to look at the cause and try to prevent that from happening again once I get the ferritin up. So these things are, uh, are really baked right in. Yeah, you're very right. I often, I teach my fellows and residents that anemia is a symptom, it's not a disease. Yeah. And so you have to look for the reason for why you're anemic and not just start the iron, which happens so often. And I don't understand why people don't think about it, but I think I educate my patients too. If some, most of the time you get adult women, I'm sure you do, that where they say, oh, I'm anemic and they put me on iron. Like that's, uh, that's a disease, <laughs> right? You have treatment. And so unfortunately they don't realize that anemia is just a symptom and you have to figure out where it's coming from and why you're anemic. And I think that's where education needs to happen across the board. For sure. And anemia itself has become so normalized for women. Like all the time I have patients telling me, oh, I've been anemic my entire adult life. Like that's no big deal. <laughs> that's true. It's crazy. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Okay, so we will now move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is Dr. Lakshmi Srivats, who's going to be talking to us about low one Willebrand factor in women and girls. And she is the professor of pediatrics in the division of hematology at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Dr. Srivats, expertise is in pediatric hemostasis and thrombosis, and she has several publications and grant awards. She's the director of the Young Women's Bleeding Disorder Clinic and currently directs the Pediatric Thrombosis Clinic. She's a member of the Medical Advisory Council and co-chair of the Thrombosis Subcommittee at the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. And uh, she's also the recipient of Excellence in Education, Women of Excellence, Norton Rose Fulbright Faculty Excellence, Rising Star Clinician, Fulbright and Jaworski Faculty Excellence, Fellow Education Awards through from 2011 to 2021. She's also the editor of a textbook which, uh, which is titled Hematology in the Adolescent Female. So we have a very apt person talking to us today about problems in women and girls. Welcome, Dr. Srivats. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank National Hemophilia Foundation Bleeding Disorders Conference for this lovely opportunity to talk to you all about low von Willebrand factor in adolescent females, a topic that is very close to my heart. I'm Lakshmi Srivats, Professor of Pediatrics in the section of Pediatric Hematology at University of Texas Health Science Center, Houston, Texas. Here is my disclosure. To begin with, let's first take a look at what we know about low von Willebrand factor in females and specifically what has been published thus far in adult women. The first interesting study in the past decade or so came from the Ireland group led by Michelle Levin with a publication in Blood in 2017 that uh, showcase their uh, information about low von Willebrand factor level and bleeding complications in their Ireland cohort called the Lovig cohort, wherein they showed that low von Willebrand factor levels are associated with significant bleeding. Subsequently, they looked at the females in this Lovig cohort and showed that 89% of adult women self-reported having heavy menstrual bleeding. About 63.5% reported having postpartum hemorrhage requiring multiple medical and surgical interventions. And also that there was a delay in diagnosis of adult women with heavy menstrual bleeding and low von Willebrand factor. Here are some more details from that study about heavy menstrual bleeding in adult women with low von Willebrand factor. In the Lovig cohort, 120 were females, of whom 89% reported having heavy menstrual bleeding, 
requiring frequent protection changes and bleeding lasting for more than seven days with clots and flooding, requiring a variety of medical interventions, including consultation and antifibrinolytic therapy, hormonal therapy, combination of hormonal and antifibrinolytic agents, desmopressin for the management of heavy menstrual bleeding, procedural or surgical management, including dilatation and curettage, endometrial ablation, and even hysterectomy, and management of complications because of heavy menstrual bleeding, including ion therapy, red blood cell transfusion, hospital admission, and emergency treatment. The bar diagram on the right side shows that several measures to look at the heavy menstrual bleeding, including the Phillips domain um, questionnaire and uh, the scores, namely ISTH bleeding assessment tool score and the condensed MCMDM von Willebrand disease score and specifically the Menorrhagia domain score in these um, scores showed significant increase or positive scoring for patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. When they subcategorize these patients based on their low von Willebrand factor levels as between 30 to 39 versus 40 to 50, can clearly show at the bottom of this bar diagram that patients with 30 to 39, the lower levels of low von Willebrand factor, had even higher scores when compared to those with levels between 40 to 50. Nevertheless, majority of these patients with low von Willebrand factor levels, ranging between 30 to 50 international units per deciliter, had experienced heavy menstrual bleeding. Looking at postpartum hemorrhage in this cohort, 61% of the 120 females had given birth to children with a mean delivery per Paris female enrollee of 2.5, of whom a third reported early postpartum hemorrhage, 15% reported delayed postpartum hemorrhage anywhere between 24 hours to six weeks, and another 19% reported having both early as well as delayed postpartum hemorrhage, and they required a variety of medical interventions, again, including medical treatment with antifibrinolytic therapy, uterotonics, ion therapy, exam under anesthesia, and even uterine tamponade to control this heavy menstrual bleeding, in addition to requiring blood products such as plasma, platelets, red blood cell transfusion, uh, and also ICU admission and surgical intervention reported in these patients. Let's now take a look to see what do we know about low von Willebrand factor in adolescent females. In 2007, a population survey conducted in healthy 15 to 16 year old teenagers in Iceland was published. And this population survey evaluated the association of mild bleeding and correlated that with von Willebrand factor levels as well as platelet function. This was a two-part study. It was a case control study. The first part was questionnaire-based and 809 teenagers responded to the questionnaire, of whom 29% reported bleeding and 7.8% reported excessive bleeding. The bleeding symptomatology reported by these teenagers are given in this table for all respondents, specifically for male versus female teenagers. And I've highlighted here the responses by the female teenagers. And you can see that in addition to heavy menstrual bleeding, these teenagers reported having a variety of bleeding symptomatology. A subset of these patients, 49 cases with excessive bleeding, underwent laboratory evaluation, looking at von Willebrand factor levels, which was controlled, which was compared with about 166 controls. And as shown in this table below, you can see that the low von Willebrand factor values were present more commonly in cases than controls with significant odds ratio. So the table um, shows the results for both sexes as well as specifically for girls. And all the low levels of von Willebrand factor, Ristocin cofactor, were between 35 to 45 international units per deciliter, except for a single case with a level of 26 units per deciliter, which would be in the range of type 1 von Willebrand disease, all the other values were in the range of low von Willebrand factor. So based on these reports in adult women and very um, few information coming from few studies in adolescent females, it seemed like low von Willebrand factor activity is associated with bleeding that is probably significant and whether 
it is just associated with heavy menstrual bleeding alone or whether other bleeding symptoms are also very significant as shown in the Iceland study uh, was not totally clear. Also, there, as uh, many of you know, for almost two decades or so, there has been a uh, debate ongoing um, that low von Willebrand factor activity is just a bleeding risk factor, that it is not a bleeding disorder. And so it should not be considered and uh, patients should not be managed as though this is a bleeding disorder. So we realized that there is a need to better define adolescent females with low von Willebrand factor in order to define their bleeding spectrum and to stratify the risk to bleed and also thereby to tailor their therapy to prevent complications. So we undertook a multi-center single arm observational cohort study to delineate the phenotype and genotype of adolescent females with low von Willebrand factor related heavy menstrual bleeding. And this study was conducted from 2017 to 2019. The objectives of this multi-center study were to describe the spectrum of bleeding phenotype and related complications in these patients, to describe the severity of heavy menstrual bleeding as assessed by the pictorial blood assessment chart score, and the severity of bleeding phenotype as assessed by the ISTH bleeding assessment tool score. And also to analyze the genotype of this patient population, which had not been done until that point. We enrolled postmenarchal females with ages less than 21 years with heavy menstrual bleeding as diagnosed based on the pictorial blood assessment chart score more than 100 and low von Willebrand factor. Clinical phenotype data were obtained from these patients, including the types and severity of bleeding signs and symptoms. PBAC and BAT scores were collected. Laboratory values pertaining to anemia and von Willebrand factor levels were also gathered. We also gathered response to desmoplasin challenge, management details, and clinical outcomes in these patients. In addition, whole exome sequencing was performed on available blood samples from the study subjects. Members of the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders were participating centers in the study. And a total of 113 adolescent females with heavy menstrual bleeding and a diagnosis of low von Willebrand factor were enrolled from various centers across the country as illustrated in this map below. The phenotype results of these patients um, has been published already in Blood Advances in 2020. And as shown in this bar diagram, you can see that these patients had a variety of bleeding symptoms in addition to experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding, namely cutaneous bleeding, bleeding from minor wounds, epistaxis, oral cavity bleeding, and a small percentage with GI bleeding, showing that predominantly the bleeding were mucocutaneous. Also, about 15% each had surgical-related bleeding and bleeding related to dental extraction. When we looked at the PBAC and the BAT scores as shown in the scatter dot plots, you can clearly see that the PBAC score was significantly elevated in most of these patients. The red line indicates the cutoff value of 100 above which PBAC score indicates heavy menstrual bleeding. Likewise, in the ISTH bleeding assessment tool score, more than 90% had elevated BAT scores and many of them with significantly elevated BAT scores. Overall, 75 patients, that is 69%, had bleeding symptoms, more than two bleeding symptoms. 94% had a BAT score more than two, and 90% had severe heavy menstrual bleeding with BAT, heavy menstrual bleeding domain score, more than or equal to two, and reported having continuous bleeding that was noted in 30%, passing large clots in 73%, and having overflow of menstrual bleeding in 81%, all indicating the severity of their heavy menstrual bleeding. As shown in this uh, table one below, you can see that for a variety of these bleeding symptomatology and the various bleeding domains in the ISTH BAT score, many patients had scores of two, three, and four, indicating the severity of their overall bleeding phenotype. In addition, these patients had bleeding complications. 60% developed iron deficiency, 21% had anemia, 12% required red blood cell transfusion, and 10% were hospitalized for heavy menstrual bleeding management. When we looked at the DDAVP challenge test, majority had an excellent response to DDAVP, 
So at one to one and a half hours post DDAVP, the median fold increase in von Willebrand factor was 2.9. And then at three to four hours, it was sustained at two. However, you can note that there is a subset of patients who did not have either a significant rise at one to one and a half hours or a sustained response at three to four hours. And so it seems like DDAVP challenge test will be useful in this patient population with low von Willebrand factor as well, um, in order to document that the response is good and sustained prior to using it as therapy. Looking at management and outcome details in these patients, you can see that these patients were treated with a variety of hemostatic therapies, including desmopressin, humate B, and antifibrinolytic agents, a variety of hormonal therapy, 46% of these patients required both hormonal and hemostatic therapy for the control of their menstrual bleeding, again indicating the severity of the heavy menstrual bleeding in these patients, and a very small percentage even required procedural therapy. With treatment, 56% had improvement and 12% had resolution of their menstrual bleeding. However, despite therapy, one-third of these patients reported continuing to have heavy menstrual bleeding and thereby indicating that we still need to evaluate and manage these patients very promptly in order to improve their outcome. Moving on to genotype analysis, blood samples were available in 86 adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding from this cohort uh, whose genotype was compared with 660 controls by doing whole exome sequencing. And the results are, are uh, summarized here. We found rare variants in anemia-related genes, in bleeding disorder-related genes, and common variants in the gene FIRM2. This uh, report is currently um, under review in blood advances. This table here gives you the list of anemia-related gene variants that were found in the heterozygous state in these patients, perhaps these variants, presence of these variants contributed to the anemia that these patients experience because of heavy menstrual bleeding. Also, we found several variants that are related to bleeding disorders in these patients. Von Willebrand disease, von Willebrand factor gene variants were definitely noted because these patients have, have low von Willebrand factor. But in addition, interestingly, we also found gene variants in platelet glycoprotein 4 deficiency, platelet type 11 bleeding disorder, and hereditary coprocorphyria. And uh, possibly the presence of these gene variants could have contributed and also increased the severity of their bleeding phenotype. Three comments, SNPs and linkage disequilibrium in the FIRM2 gene pass genome-wide significance of note. The FIRM2 gene encodes a cytoskeletal protein that is a crucial regulator of integrin function. It regulates hemostasis and is required for angiogenesis and blood vessel homeostasis. So it's interesting that we found um, SNPs and linkage disequilibrium in this FIRM2 gene, and perhaps that plays a role in the blood vessel homeostasis in the uterine environment, contributing to heavy menstrual bleeding. So to conclude the genotype analysis, this ours is the first study to our knowledge reporting on genotype in adolescent females with heavy menstrual bleeding and low von Willebrand factor. And we observed excess of rare non-synonymous variants in genes involved in several bleeding disorders and excess variants in genes causing anemias. And also three common SNPs and linkage to equilibrium in the FIRM2 gene which pass genome-wide significance. Our findings need validation in larger cohorts. We try to validate this looking at the UK biobank data, but that population uh, phenotype was not very well characterized, similar to how ours is characterized. And so the comparison proved to be difficult. We hope that we will be able to validate with other larger cohorts in the future, or perhaps even expand on, on our own cohort. And uh, identifying genetic variants, risk variants, may help improve risk stratification and severity stratification in this patient population and may help to tailor therapy based on the 
severity of bleeding and the risk stratification in these patients and thereby help to improve patient outcome. So based on all these studies uh, that we now have, we can summarize the variety of bleeding complications present in female adolescents with low von Willebrand factor. This uh, table was taken from a manuscript that has been recently published in JAMA Pediatrics in 2021. So the types of bleeding symptomatology these patients can experience include menstrual related issues, including heavy menstrual bleeding, increased rate of surgical interventions like dilatation and curatage and even hysterectomy, complications such as iron deficiency and anemia, which can in turn lead to decreased quality of life, including fatigue, increased time loss from school or work. Other significant gynecological issues like hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, rupture and hemoperitoneum, which can prove to be a surgical emergency, increased prevalence of mid-cycle mid pain, namely Mittelschmerz and even dysmenorrhea, and reports of increased incidence of other gynecological conditions like endometriosis, polyps, and fibroids, and childbirth-related issues, namely early as well as delayed postpartum hemorrhage and vulvar hematoma. So for the past two decades or so, we've had a debate, as I mentioned earlier, as to whether low von Willebrand factor is just a bleeding risk and not a bleeding disorder. But I think now, based on all these recent studies, we have come to a conclusion that this condition needs to be addressed as a bleeding disorder. So the patients will be recognized and evaluated early and managed promptly. So the recent guidelines on the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease uh, published by, in collaboration with ASH, ISTH, National Hemophilia Foundation, and World Federation of Hemophilia, in 2021 in blood advances states that for patients with abnormal bleeding, a von Willebrand factor level of less than 0.5 should be taken as confirming the diagnosis of type one von Willebrand disease. So I'm very happy to state that we've really come a long way in um, diagnosing these patients with low von Willebrand factor and hopefully moving forward we will be able to evaluate them appropriately and manage them in order to prevent their long-term complications. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you to National Hemophilia Foundation again for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srivats. That was an excellent presentation on the phenotype and genotype of our patients who have low von Willebrand factor. And I think your work has really contributed to help raise awareness of the bleeding complications that this subset of population faced on a regular basis and helped us manage these patients more appropriately also. Um, so in your study, I have a question for you. and. Uh, did you actually look for possible concomitant other mild bleeding disorders that could have contributed to the bleeding phenotype in these patients? So um, as the inclusion criteria for the study was uh, the presence of low von Willebrand factor, von Willebrand levels between 30 to 50 international units per deciliter. Um, and the study exclusion criteria was identification of other bleeding disorders. Uh, meaning these patients you know, should have had a normal platelet count and PT, PTT, and fibrinogen. Uh, we didn't specify evaluating them for platelet function disorders because I think that is not typically done. If you find one uh, cause for a bleeding disorder, then you may not uh, simultaneously assess them uh, for a platelet function defect. But nevertheless, some patients um, had had platelet aggregation and other platelet function studies done as well. Um, so if they had had another identified bleeding disorder, so overall, I think we enrolled 113, but we ended up excluding a couple of patients because one had actually a von Willebrand level less than 30. So that would have given that patient a diagnosis of type one von Willebrand disease. And another patient had a factor 11 deficiency, um, as well, in addition to low von Willebrand factor. And so that patient was also ex excluded because we really wanted to just, um, focus on just low von Willebrand factor and see what other underlying hemostatic and thrombophilic abnormalities they may have that may modify their phenotype. Thank you, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, 
I do not see any other questions here, but I just, I think I just wanted you to comment on the fact uh, uh, that you need to really look for bleeding disorders in some of these patients and having a comprehensive panel of uh, workup that you should do, I think is, uh, is, is really, really important. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this has uh, been a topic that's been close to my heart for the past decade or so. Um, and specifically on low one liver and factor, I think you know, we started, we, we thought about this study probably about seven, eight years ago. And then you know, it took some time to put everything together to get the grant and all that. Um, and what even prompted me to do this study is the fact that when we started our uh, Young Women's Bleeding Disorders Clinic at our center, which was, you know, one, we were one of the first centers to start this effort along with our gynecology partner, we saw so many teenage females coming to us with significant heavy menstrual bleeding and with some other bleeding complications as well and having this low von Willebrand factor. And interestingly, the lack of awareness was not just amongst the patient population. Some of our own colleagues would not consider this a significant bleeding issue and so would not really treat the patient and at that time, I had also started talking to community physicians, community gynecologists, and when we went and talked to them about von Willebrand and heavy menstrual bleeding, and they would say, we wouldn't test these patients for von Willebrand, we will just put them on hormones. So a lot of shocking um, you know, information that I heard um, from physicians, from gynecologists, from hematologists even. Um, and so that kind of really gave me the impetus to take this forward to evaluate this patient population to um, clearly define their phenotype and to look further into their genotype. And so clearly at least based on our study, I mean, uh, now we are glad, like uh, just like uh, Dr. James said, I think we have a better understanding of how to evaluate these patients and how to diagnose these patients with von Willebrand factor levels between 30 to 50 with bleeding symptomatology. But I mm -hmm. think we still have a far way to go in terms of how to treat them, how to fine tune their therapy. And so we will be able to treat everyone appropriately and prevent complications in the adult patient population. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. I see that Dr. James has a comment and a question. Please go ahead and ask. Thank you. So Dr. Sridas, I wanna congratulate you um, on such an important study. And also to personally thank you for supporting that recommendation, which honestly, I've gotten so much grief about um, since we published the guideline. It's by far, and we knew it at the time, but it is by far the most controversial recommendation we made. And I think everything that you just presented explains why we made that recommendation. And we made a strong recommendation, which is rare in the guideline. And so my question, because I have to justify this all the time would be, and everything you just presented is the support for what we did it. But what do you think the one or two critical pieces of information are to support that recommendation um, from your data? Uh, that's a tough question to answer because I think there's so much information that is out there and, and so much more to be done as well. What I can maybe point you to and what actually shocked us on the clinical side when we took care of these patients is they beat uh, the PBAC score. You know, some of them had PBAC scores more than 1,000. And, they, and, and if you read through that manuscript, you will see that a significant number of these patients didn't have just intermittent monthly bleeding. They had continuous bleeding, um, you know, passing clots and flooding, and some of them having significant anemia. So I think that really tells you how severe their bleeding is and that hormone therapy may not be sufficient. They have to be appropriately treated. And as we all know, diagnosing von Willebrand disease in a female presenting with menstrual bleeding not only addresses her menstrual bleeding, but helps us to understand the phenotype overall. You know, this patient is going to go for a tooth extraction. We have to address that. Um, if the patient is going for a surgery, if we don't address that, the patient is going to bleed during surgery. And then, of course, hemorrhagic ovariances. And then as this patient goes on to have a reproductive life and has uh, pregnancy and delivery, bleeding around that time. So you know, all that has to be addressed. So menarche is definitely a clear uh, 
you know, it's a time period when these patients come to our attention. And if we miss diagnosing them and treating them, there's so many complications that these patients can see. And of course, in a clinical practice, quite often I have seen my patients whom I diagnose and then their mother telling me, yes, I've had heavy menstrual bleeding. I've had hysterectomy because of that. And so many mothers telling me. So I think all these things are you know, pointers as to why we really need to evaluate these patients thoroughly and why we need to diagnose them and manage them, not just with hormonal therapy, but also hemostatic therapy. Thank you very much. That's an excellent discussion. So I have two, one more question. Uh, Dr. Matthew asked, um, a provocative question. Given that you found genotypic abnormalities, uh, other one will, in addition to one will brand disease in these patients, does that mean that such patients who have anemia, we should start looking for, uh, or getting prior odds for genetic studies? That's a tough one. So, like I said, uh, you know, we uh, looked at the genotype in eight to six patients, um, considering that it's a, in a study in adolescence. Um, it is, it's a sizable number, nevertheless. It's not a large number to right away um, recommend you know, genetic testing as a, as a, a, a clinical measure. Uh, we definitely need to expand. I think we have probably just opened up that area to understand why there's so much phenotype variability. I mean, not just in one liberan, but I think this may be expanded to patient populations like, you know, hemophilia carriers. And, you know, some bleed and some don't bleed. Some with low factor uh, have more severe bleeding at the same factor level. Others don't have severe bleeding. So I think we definitely need to do a lot more research in this area to understand the pathophysiology better, to tease this out much better. It's a very interesting observation we found about that firm two. Uh, gene variant, and I think that uh, will have to be uh, looked at further in larger patient population to understand that better. That is a gene that actually uh, leads to platelet aggregation, and um, um, it uh, promotes um, interaction between endothelial cells and platelets, and if that is affected, that may be another way of looking at heavy menstrual bleeding in general. So we definitely have a long way to go. That's very, very important data. I have one other question from, uh, uh, it's an interesting question. I've never um, thought about it this way. They're asking if there are any studies on mast cell activation syndromes increase in heparin and therefore complicating bleeding in those who have von Willebrand disease and high levels of factor activity. And they also asked about uh, concomitant Ehlers-Danlos loss uh, potentially in these patients contributing to the bleeding symptoms. Yeah, I mean, let me take the second one first because I think, um, uh, you know, all, um, many of us who are dealing with uh, bleeding disorders in females clearly know that connective tissue disorders can also contribute to uh, bleeding, certainly menstrual bleeding. Um, I have seen that in my patient population time to time. We deal with all the patients and it's an extremely difficult patient population to manage because they don't have clearly hemostatic abnormality. So when they go for surgery or procedures, how do you manage these patients is a tough question. So definitely, I think that information is there, whether um, despite, yeah, yeah. So definitely early dandelos can contribute to bleeding. Regarding mast cell activation syndromes, increase of heparin, that's a very interesting piece of information. I don't think that is something that we have really explored very well, definitely not in the uh, population of females with bleeding disorders, but something maybe we can look at. Yeah, okay. I see Dr. Rajpurkar has a question. Please go ahead and ask. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Srivast. Lakshmi, fantastic presentation and absolutely clinically useful. Any thoughts to doing a longitudinal study as to what happens to the von Willebrand factor as these adolescent girls or ind individuals actually grow and what happens to their uh, von Willebrand factor levels and whether their symptoms improve or they stay the same? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, Madhvi. Um, there is some report, uh, and I think Dr. James will agree as well, that um, in von Willebrand disease in general, as uh, patients uh, age, um, as they become you know, elderly patients, that the von Willebrand factor levels may improve. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens to these patients with low von Willebrand factor. 
um, just you know, based on our observation, our study um, makes me wonder if there are like subpopulations within this population. Maybe there's a subset who will continue to bleed, and maybe there may be a subset that may not continue to bleed. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, there is also, I think, um, a very small study uh, in children uh, that has been looked at, looking at levels both in children as well as their parents, and that has pointed to this you know subtype of one subset where they just maintain this low levels throughout whereas another subset seems to um, increase but it was, uh, the numbers were extremely small so i think it'll be very interesting to study that longitudinally yeah, and, I think, and it, I think the reason is very often what happens is on repeated analysis if their levels improve and now reach about 50 the tendency is to de-diagnose them and say that you don't have von Willebrand's disease, but I wonder if the bleeding risk continues because their levels continue at a lower than normal um, frequency, so to say. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question whether there are other contributing factors in addition to von Willebrand which might contribute to bleeding. And of course, knowing that von Willebrand levels can fluctuate from time to time, and so that, that in our practice, at least we typically test them uh, a couple of times, two to three times at least, to make sure that we are diagnosing them accurately. Um, so all those factors will come into play. Uh, a, a longitudinal study may be a difficult one, but I think it will be really interesting to undertake. That's wonderful. And I think, you know, that that's a really good question about the longitudinal um, study, but also, and also the importance of if we all, if all our factor levels go up as we age, and we experience different challenges as we get older, right? And our ability to tolerate or not bleed with those challenges is obviously uh, dependent on that increase that we're seeing as we get older. So maybe this population, even if it gets higher, will never be at the same level as a normal person would be. And that may contribute or still result in an in increased uh, risk for bleeding in these patients with those challenges, whether it's surgery or childbirth or postpartum issues or uh, perimenopausal issues for that matter. So I think that that definitely is something that uh, should be looked at and maybe we need to pay more attention to that. That was a really good question. So. And agree right. more. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker, I think we can go now to our next speaker. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Madhvi Rajpurkar, who's going to be talking to us about a survey on bleeding and anticoagulation. I have uh, the, the, the fortunate, I'm very fortunate to be a colleague for Dr. Rajpurkar and we work together at the same institution. And it's been a wonderful experience for me uh, to be able to be associated with her. Uh, she is a professor of pediatrics at Central Michigan University and the division chief uh, for our Department of Hematology at Children's Hospital of Michigan. She's also a voluntary professor of pediatrics and holds the Purcell Lusher Endowed Chair for Research at Wayne State University. Her research interests are in pediatric thrombosis as well as bleeding disorders. She also has uh, several publications, more than 70, and multiple book chapters. Uh, and her expertise in thrombosis as well as hemostasis is very well appreciated within our division and also nationally and internationally. So thank you for presenting today. Um, thank you. And can everybody see my slides OK? OK, I'm assuming you can. So hello, everyone. Greetings from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, thank you, Mira, for your kind introduction and the opportunity to present our research here today. It is indeed an honor to be here in the midst of such esteemed colleagues. Uh, I'm the odd duck over here because I'm going to talk about bleeding in clotting disorders. And I hope by the end of the presentation, I'm going to convince you to adopt these patients, so adolescent girls, who have bleeding manifestations, but have an underlying clotting disorder, because this is an orphan disease as well. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna discuss the results of a multinational survey that we conducted to assess the management uh, practices of anticoagulation associated reproductive tract bleeding. So to begin, I have a few uh, disclaimers. I have no conflicts of interest. 
This was a collaborative effort and my co-authors are listed here. And in the interest of being uh, time sensitive, I'm going to discuss just the salient findings of the study, but the detailed results were published in thrombosis research earlier today, earlier this year. So if anyone wants to do any further reading, I urge you to please refer to that publication. And one thing I urge you to also consider is that although survey results are very interesting uh, and they reveal uh, interesting cross-sectional data, there are several inherent limitations to conducting surveys. There are methodologic constraints and thus uh, granular data are often not available. Also, as with any survey, there's a reporting bias and the results may not be generalizable. So please keep that in mind. So a little bit of the background as to why we chose to conduct the survey. I don't think I need to stress to this group the importance of a normal menstrual cycle. In, indeed, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have declared the menstrual cycle to be considered a fifth vital sign of health in the adolescent female. Even so, we know that 30 to 40% of girls suffer for he from heavy menstrual bleeding and abnormal uterine bleeding, either because of an immature hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis or because of the first presentation of an underlying bleeding disorder. We're also well aware that the consequences of heavy or abnormal menstrual bleeding often leads to iron deficiency anemia, poor quality of life, poor mental health, hospitalizations, all leading to significant morbidity and healthcare costs and utilization. However, there's one other aspect we should consider. Paradoxically, adolescent females are at a discrepantly higher risk for venous thromboembolism. It is estimated uh, from the chat registry that approximately one in 105 hospitalized adolescent females develop a VTE. Other registry data confirm that adolescent females have 1.7 to three times the VTE rate as compared to the male counterparts. This increased VTE rate translates to increasing use of anticoagulation, which leads and adds to the incremental risk of heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, surprisingly, there are very few high quality studies that have evaluated the risk of anticoagulation induced or associated reproductive tract bleeding in adolescent females. In fact, there are only two single center retrospective cohort studies, both of which evaluated the risk of bleeding with low molecular weight heparin and or warfarin, and have listed the frequency of uh, heavy menstrual bleeding over here. We also know that recent evidence suggests that direct oral anticoagulants are being increasingly used in the adolescent population. In fact, a recent paper on the analysis of the Athen database showed that 16% of the uh, adolescent young adult patients were prescribed DOACs, 63% of which were females between the year 2010 and 2019. And this rate, we anticipate is going to increase given the recent approval of dabigatran in the pediatric age group. Now from adults, we know that the risk for heavy menstrual or abnormal uterine bleeding uh, is uh, different and there seems to be a differential risk based on the DOAC classification. So we know that the highest risks with, uh, is with anti-10A DOACs, especially with rivaroxaban. And there have been several methodological limitations of adult studies because uh, granular data were not obtained, and these were mostly post hoc uh, evaluations of piv pivotal clinical trials. Now, another aspect that we need to consider is uh, if for adolescent gynecologic health is that AYA females frequently use hormonal therapy for contraception. In fact, data suggests that by the age of 20 years, approximately 80% of females are sexually active. Half of them use oral contraceptive pills and 19% use progestin indication, injections. We are also well aware that hormonal therapy is the mainstay in the management of heavy menstrual bleeding. We also know that various studies have shown that hormonal therapy may indeed be a provoking risk factor for venous thromboembolism. And the rate of hormone provoked VTE varies between anywhere between six to 69%, depending on the study uh, in adolescent females. 
Now, management of hormonal therapy after a hormone-provoked VTE is controversial, and there are currently contradictory recommendations. The World Health Organization recommends stopping hormonal therapy due to a perceived higher risk of thrombosis. And on the other hand, ISDH recommends that we continue hormonal therapy along with uh, anticoagulation. The only data that we have are from uh, is the post hoc analysis from the Einstein study, which was in adult females, and it did not reveal an increase in recurrent VTE uh, when anticoagulation was continued along with hormonal therapy. Currently, there are no data regarding the use of concomitant OCP and anticoagulation in adolescent females. So motivated by these gaps in our knowledge and to understand the current practices and scope of anticoagulation induced reproductive tract bleeding, we conducted a multinational survey. The study was approved by the local IRB. We developed a questionnaire in SurveyMonkey and we sent the questionnaire to the members of the Women's Health and the Pediatric and Neonatal Subcommittee of the ISTH and physicians who identified themselves to be pediatric treaters uh, from the HDRS Society. We had uh, 251 respondents who attempted the survey, giving us a response rate of approximately 33%. As you can see here, uh, approximately half the respondents were within 10 years of training. Half of them were pediatric hematologists. Uh, more, the majority of them were from academic medical centers, and half of them were from the United States and the other half from other countries. So we first inquired about the patterns of reproductive tract bleeding. And as you can see here, the majority of the respondents reported having evaluated heavy menstrual bleeding. Half of them reported having evaluated abnormal uh, uterine bleeding. And very surprisingly, at least to me, 13% and 19% reported having evaluated anticoagulant associated hemorrhagic ovariances with and without rupture. When asked about the most frequent anticoagulant, uh, which was associated with uh, reproductive tract bleeding, 41% of the respondents reported the use of DOAX, uh, especially rivaroxaban, and 31% reported uh, associa association with warfarin, while a small minority perceived that low molecular weight heparins were associated with bleeding, so across the board. We then inquired about how often respondents reviewed the menstrual history before the initiation or counseled about the risk of hemi menstrual bleeding during anti anticoagulation. And by self-report, only half the respondents always reviewed the menstrual history prior to initiating anticoagulation, and only about 60% counseled their patients about monitoring for heavy menstrual bleeding during anticoagulation. And when we asked about the methods that were used, the majority of the respondents indicated that they use subjective measures, such as patient's recall of menstrual symptoms, or, or questions provided by the healthcare provider. A small minority used the ISTH BAT or the PBAC scores for evaluating menstrual history. When we reviewed the treatment strategies uh, that were used to manage reproductive tract bleeding, we find nearly equal number of respondents start hormonal uh, supplementation or antifibrinolytic therapy for their initial management. And about 12 to 15% of respondents uh, modify their anticoagulation regimen. When asked about the choice of hormonal therapy, 42% indicated that they would prefer to start their patients on progestin only pill. And the same number indicated that they would uh, uh, use a hormonal IUD. We also postulated that treatment options may differ depending on the timing of the onset of heavy menstrual bleeding after thrombosis. And by the way, adult data suggests that uh, the timing of the heavy menstrual bleeding is approximately 28 days. Uh, so when bleeding occurred within four to six weeks, 30% chose to just observe, that is manage iron deficiency anemia, while 20% and 22% indicated switching either to an alternate anticoagulant or initiate hormonal therapy therapy. On the other hand, when bleeding occurred after four to six weeks or after the onset of thrombosis, more uh, people chose to um, modify either the intensity of anticoagulation or start hormonal therapy. Now, the next question that we inquired about was how did the respondents manage 
hormonal therapy if the uh, AYA female had, an, had a hormone provoked BT event. And for the purpose of the survey, we defined hormonal therapy uh, as estrogen progesterone combination pill, progesterone only pill or depomidroxy progesterone. And to my surprise, 46% indicated that they would continue an alternate hormonal therapy while the patient was on anticoagulation, while 33% reported that they would continue the same hormonal therapy along with anticoagulation. And 13% indicated, so a small minority indicated that uh, we would stop, that they would stop all hormonal therapy. And in the people who switched to alternate hormonal therapy, 60% chose to use a hormonal IUD. One third of them chose to use a progestin only pill and a small minority indicated switching to low dose estrogen progesterone uh, combination pill. When we were, when we asked about the management of hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, the majority of respondents had not seen in, uh, these in their practice. However, those who had evaluated hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, most of them managed them conservatively. Uh, however, 18% indicated that they needed to perform a surgical intervention for the management of hemorrhagic ovarian cysts. Uh, the majority of people who had evaluated uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts indicated that they prescribed hormonal therapy to suppress ovulation when for the management of long-term uh, management of hemorrhagic ovarian cysts. Coming to the complications of anticoagulation associated reproductive tract bleeding, we found that there was a high proportion of complications that could be attributed to both anticoagulation associated reproductive tract bleeding, but also to the interventions used to control anticoagulation re uh, asso uh, associated reproductive tract bleeding. So as you can see here, hospitalization were commonly seen with both uh, the, the bleeding and the interventions. Iron deficiency anemia was obviously seen more frequently with just the bleeding. Uh, poor quali quality of life was seen both with anticoagulation associate, uh, associated reproductive tract bleeding and with the interventions used to control and multi-specialty consults were quite off, commonly seen. 17% of the respondents indicated that they had seen recurrent VTE, which they attributed to the interventions that were used to control the anticoagulation induced uh, reproductive tract bleeding. We then uh, compared the differences in practice patterns between US and non-US participants. And we found that US respondents uh, reported a higher association of anticoagulation associated reproductive tract bleeding with low molecular weight heparin, perhaps uh, indicating the high use of uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, in the US patients. Uh, also US respondents were more likely to switch to an alternate hormonal therapy if the AYA female uh, had a hormone provoked VTE. And they were also more likely to start hormonal therapy as first choice for management of heavy menstrual bleeding as compared to the non-US respondents who were more likely to modify anticoagulation if a, a heavy menstrual bleeding developed during anticoagulation. Um, similar patterns were also seen in uh, pediatric hematologists versus others. So I hope uh, that I have shown you that there are certain ident identified gaps that we identified from our survey. That first of all, menstrual history was not routinely reviewed prior to initiation of anticoagulation or during anticoagulation. And we believe that this may lead to underestimation of uh, and rec under recognition of this disorder. We also showed that respondents identified a differential risk of reproductive tract bleeding, especially with DOACs and mostly with rivaroxaban. And despite a lack of high quality evidence, we saw a wide variability in the management of anticoagulation associated reproductive tract bleeding. We also saw, saw that the timing of bleeding after the thrombotic event influenced the respondent's choice of therapy. And we saw differences in management strategies between US and non-US participants and between pediatric hematologists and others. So where do we go next? Now, in adults, currently there are 
two prospective studies that are being conducted. The first study is the Team VTE study, which is a prospective multi-center study. And this is going to prospectively assess the rate of new onset abnormal uterine bleeding in adult female VTE patients. And they are conducting PBACs, ISTH bats, and a quality of life score monthly for six months. And Dr. Clark presented preliminary results at the ISTH conference in July. And the results show that new onset abnormal uterine bleeding was seen in 60% of women. Now, the MEDIA study is again a multi center prospective cohort study in adult, adult women who developed HMB on anti 10 A DOAX, and they plan to randomize to either switching to Dibigatran. Uh, either addition of tranexamic acid and continuation, or uh, the third option is to continue the same anticoagulant. Now, none of these studies include uh, females less than 18 years of age. So we have proposed Maya, which is menstrual bleeding in adolescent and young adult women on, an, on uh, direct oral anticoagulants. And we have, this study is actually supported by the thrombosis committee uh, of the FWGBD. So thank you, Lakshmi, for your support. Um, and uh, we have submitted the study and it's pending funding support. So I hope I've piqued your interest and thank you for your attention. I will take questions. Thank you, Madhvi. That was an excellent presentation and uh, very thought provoking. And I think uh, um, there are, there's so much that we don't know is what, what it tells me. Um, I, I have a question for you and I hope that uh, other panelists also will chime in and get some questions in for you as well. Uh, essentially, I think first of all, I think gathering data is going to be a very key component to getting a better understanding for even how to design a study in this population. And I think our, our knowledge of even thrombosis in pediatrics is sort of evolving as we go. And now to talk about bleeding in thrombosis is going to be a challenge. And uh, so in terms of with the expanding spectrum of anticoagulant therapy that's coming up, how feasible or easy is it going to be for us to design these studies? And should we, we, we can't limit anybody's therapy because we want to study them. So I'm just trying to understand how, how it's going to be really challenging for anybody to design studies in this area. So, yeah, I mean, I can tell you having uh, at least designed the Maya study, we faced a number of challenges. One was, uh, and I didn't show the data here, we did ask respondents about how many uh, adolescent females do they um, see every year and how many of them uh, are started on DOAX. So the most frequent is about five to 10 per year and about 60% of them are started on a DOAX. Okay, so for any study, one, I think we are going to need multi-center prospective evaluation. The second uh, sort of problem we found, or I found in designing the study was that the current instruments that we have, for example, the ISTH bat or the PBAC scores have all been validated to diagnose bleeding disorders. They've really not been validated to, um, to diagnose bleeding and anticoagulation. Um, and then uh, the cutoffs of 100 and 150 that are commonly used for heavy menstrual bleeding will not be applicable because a girl could start with a PBAC of 80 and then go on to 120, and that would qualify her to have heavy menstrual bleeding. So it's almost like every uh, patient is going to have to serve as her own control uh, when we do this prospectively. And as you said, you know, to first, before we start on any comparative effectiveness trial, we're just gonna to have to have a prospective observational study, which is what um, we have tried to do in this study. The other thing we also need to do is because it is rare, pediatric thrombosis, we have to have an alternate mechanism of including females or adolescent girls who want to continue uh, birth control pills or hormonal therapy. And so that's sort of, that was the challenge 
truly challenging. Uh, and I think the a question from uh, Lauren Amos says, in patients who experience VT on oral contraceptives, do you stop the OCP or do you continue with initiation of anticoagulation? I know you sort of alluded to it in your presentation. Yeah, so I can only say that this is controversial, right? The World Health Organization's recommendation is you stop it. On the other hand, the ISTH recommendations is that you can continue along with anticoagulation. And as I mentioned, the only data we have is from the post-hoc analysis, the Martinelli study from Einstein, uh, where they evaluated, uh, you know, females who continued on, both, on hormonal therapy. And the rate or the recurrent uh, VTE rate was no different in the patients who had continued hormonal therapy versus those who didn't. Um, it, apparently, it seems like our respondents, people are using hormonal therapy. However, I, we, I cannot say that that's uh, evidence-based. Yeah, yeah. I see that uh, Lakshmi Srivats has a question now. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting and an important study, Madhvi. Just very happy to be a part of the study as well. Um, and my question is, uh, you know, when you look at DOAX, Darbigadran has received FDA approval ahead of rivaroxaban. So in, in my practice and also in, in probably elsewhere as well, some pediatric hematologists may be now more keen to use Darbigadran rather than rivaroxaban. And in the uh, Darbigadran phase two, phase three trials, uh, definitely I think the bleeding complications seemed higher. So I, I think it'll be important to compare uh, even within DOACs between Dabigatran versus Rivaroxaban. And the only data that I have found on Dabigatran and heavy menstrual bleeding is from the Hokusai post hoc analysis. And there the hazard ratio was 0 0.6 and they compared you know, Dabigatran to Warfarin. Now, if you look at uh, the incidence or the new onset abnormal uterine bleeding in Warfarin patients, it's 50 to 60%. So a hazard rate of 0.6 is still significant. It's not insignificant, uh, especially given the fact that our adolescent girls already have a high risk of bleeding, right? So for sure, Dabigatran has to be evaluated. Yeah, I think there are several challenges that we're going to have in this uh, arena, but uh, very important work that needs to be done because I think these are the patients who unfortunately are stuck between a rock and a hard place where they need the anticoagulation, but you can't afford to let them uh, deal with the consequences without addressing them. So I think it's uh, it, it it does need to be addressed significantly. And so, yeah, yeah I, you know, thank you, Mira, for allowing us me to present this uh, in this forum today because this is again, like I said, an orphan disease or an orphan condition. Most people think that this is because anticoagulation is temporary that it doesn't cause or if there is bleeding, what's the big deal? However, we know of several girls who need prolonged anticoagulation. I mean, we have several girls who have lupus or heart conditions who need uh, prolonged anticoagulation and they do suffer from heavy, heavy menstrual bleeding. And what's the appropriate management there? So certainly, you know, uh, um, I think this, this condition also needs to be adopted in women with blood disorders. I don't know if I missed this in your presentation. Have, have people looked at it in warfarin in adult women? Was there any increased risk of heavy menstrual bleeding and warfarin? Because I think that population is much larger. Yeah. Yes, uh, so adult data suggests up to 60% of patients on warfarin may develop abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay. And I guess we haven't really done anything for that population yet either. Well, actually, the uh, the only two reports uh, that are there are one is from Lakshmi Srivat's group, and the other is from Paul Monagal's group, who have looked at both. Uh, uh, you know, Paul Monagal looked at Warfarin, while Lakshmi has looked at every every player. Uh, so those are the two case sort of series that we have. Mm. Okay. Okay. So Dr. Prasad Matthew has a suggestion for you. He says, great information, and I think you may want to include an arm if there are patients on Lobinox in your Maya study to complete the analysis fully. I, I agree that ideally that would be the ideal case, but, uh, um, you know, we, I, I, I completely agree that, and perhaps not in Maya, I just think that we need prospective data on all anticoagulants, regardless. Yeah. 
So thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, set of uh, talks that we've had so far. Thank you to all the presenters for taking the time and giving us such uh, insightful information. We will now take a break for 20 minutes. I know we said 15 before, but we'll expand it out to 20 and then we'll come back and meet in 20 minutes. Please don't. Um, <laughs> please don't log out. Uh, we really hope to continue because uh, the next set of presenters are equally good and have wonderful information that I'm sure all of you are going to enjoy. Hello, everybody. It's 510 and glad that all of you are still with us uh, for another exciting, um, uh, after, an, after the break for another exciting session on this uh, active research on women and girls with uh, bleeding disorders. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Lauren Amos, who's going to talk to us about combination therapy in women with bleeding disorders. Dr. Amos is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City in the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology, and she's an associate program director for the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program. She completed her pediatric residency and hematology oncology fellowship at Children's Mercy, and she completed an additional year of fellowship in pediatric coagulation medicine, also at Children's Mercy. Her academic interests include medical education, uh, venous thromboembolism prevention, and adolescent females with inherited bleeding disorders. Thank you so much for presenting to us today, and take it away. Well, thank you so much uh, to uh, the National Hemophilia uh, Foundation and um, Griffles for the opportunity to speak today uh, about a topic that I am uh, very excited about. So uh, today I will be presenting about combination therapy to treat heavy menstrual bleeding beyond the black box warning. warning. Um, my only disclosure is that I've received honoraria from Genentech. So today I just wanna give some background about uh, current uh, therapy for heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, current evidence for using combination therapy. And then talk a little bit about the current clinical practice of using combination therapy to treat heavy menstrual bleeding in women with bleeding disorders. And then talk about my future research directions to evaluate this important topic. So as we have already heard today from our excellent speakers, heavy menstrual bleeding is a significant issue for our patients with bleeding disorders. Heavy Lauren, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're not seeing your slides. Oh. There you go. Now we can see your slides. Do oh, you want to start over? Um, I don't think so. I think we're just talking about my objective. Okay. So I think perfect. We're good. Always a, a technological issue, I'm sure, with these virtual conferences. So, um, but as I was saying, heavy menstrual bleeding um, occurs in our bleeding disorder patients um, and is very common in our adolescent patients. So, these patients uh, who have bleeding disorders and experience heavy menstrual bleeding may experience more severe heavy menstrual bleeding as compared to their counterparts who don't have bleeding disorders. So, Bleeding can be more severe in volume, um, so larger amounts of bleeding. Um, it can be more severe in terms of duration, so length of bleeding, uh, in terms of you know, the normal bleeding length of five to seven days. These uh, patients can bleed much longer than that. And then they can have more frequent menstrual bleeding as well. So frequency uh, you know, is typically once every 30 days, but um, often these females will have bleeding that lasts uh, longer and occurs you know, more than just once monthly. And this leads to a significant impact on quality of life and increased morbidity. So it has been well studied that uh, females with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding, this leads to missed school days, uh, missed work days, missed athletic activity, times with friends. Um, and then in terms of morbidity, things like severe anemia requiring hospitalization and blood transfusions, um, iron deficiency requiring treatment. So it is a significant problem uh, for these patients and affects their quality of life in, a, in an adverse way. And a recent study uh, by Dr. McGrath um, and Dr. Wayand showed that, you know, these patients also have increased risks of mental health disorders. So um, have increased rates of depression and anxiety. 
So treating heavy menstrual bleeding in these patients is, is extremely important. But unfortunately, we have no standard consensus recommendations uh, for treating these patients. Uh, you know, we have a lot of treatment options, and I know that Dr. Brown is going to talk more about this later, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there's a wide av availability of therapy that's out there. We have hormonal therapy, which can typically consists of estrogen plus progesterone therapy or progesterone only. Um, this therapy can be given in different manners, so, uh, you know, taken orally or uh, the patch or um, like uh, injections and things like that. There can also be hemostatic therapy. So for you know, our patients with bleeding disorders, they may respond to factor products or desmopressin. And then, then also there's the use of antiperitonolytics such as tranexamic acid, uh, which was improved in 2009 for the treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding in females. There's also intrauterine therapy, so intrauterine devices that are hormonal secreting or non-secreting. Um, and then there's also combination therapy. So when I refer to combination therapy, I'm referring to the use of hormonal therapy, um, with you know combined hormonal contraceptives such as estrogen and progesterone, and then, then hemostatic therapy with tranexamic acid as an antifibrinolytic. So, what is the current state of evidence for treating these patients? Unfortunately, uh, you know there was a 2016 Cochrane review that included only three randomized controlled trials for women with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and the review concluded that evidence was significantly lacking to determine what is the optimal therapy uh, for females who have bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding. And none of those randomized controlled trials included hormonal therapy, which is a mainstay option for treating uh, females with bleeding disorders. So at our institution, Dr. Uh, Carpenter and Dalit McElroy did a 10-year retrospective study looking at adolescent females with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding. And 53% of those patients failed initial treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and most were treated initially with combination of hormonal contraceptives. And so indicating that you know, hormonal contraceptives, while widely used first line, may not be adequate therapy to control heavy menstrual bleeding in our patients with bleeding disorders. So uh, I then looked at uh, patients with platelet function disorders with Dr. Carpenter, and we found similar findings that 55% of our patients with platelet function disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding also failed first line single agent treatment, and which typically consisted of combined hormonal contraceptives. So what should we do? First line single agent therapy is often not enough for these patients. So that leads to thinking about what other therapies can we use as first line options in order to optimize management of heavy menstrual bleeding and improve uh, quality of life for our patients. So this leads to the use of hormonal therapy plus antifibrinolytic therapy to try and save the acid. The prothrombotic risk of estrogen containing hormonal therapy has been established. Um, but there's been concern about tranexamic acid as an antifibrinolytic being potentially thrombotic, as tranexamic acid is a synthetic analog of the amino acid lysine and acts by irreversibly binding the lysine receptor site and preventing plasminogen conversion to plasmin and the degra degradation of fibrin. So it's effective in helping stopping bleeding by stabilizing that fibrin clot, preventing anti, uh, you know, the fibrinolysis, but is that lead to an increased risk of thrombosis? However, there have been uh, randomized controlled trials of using tranexamic acid in high risk for thrombosis patient populations, such as trauma patients, postpartum hemorrhage patients, and orthopedic surgery patients, where tranexamic acid was not shown to cause an increased risk of thrombosis. So is this risk of thrombosis um, actually something that uh, leads to not using it with hormonal therapy, or is it something that could be a valid treatment option for our patients? So this leads me to the black box warning. So unfortunately here in the United States, tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives have a black box warning. Um, and per the package insert labels for lice data or tranexamic acid, concomitant therapy with combined hormonal contraceptives may further increase the risk of blood clot, stroke, or myocardial infarction. And women using tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives should only do so if medical need and benefit outweigh potential increased risk of thrombotic events. And the clinical trials uh, using tranexamic acid excluded patients on 
combined hormonal contraceptives. So we have no evidence of that patient population in those trials to know if that thrombotic risk is actual or not. And this unfortunately creates significant challenges for our patients. So as providers, we have to counsel on this theoretical risk uh, of thrombosis um, when we're combining uh, hormonal therapy and transamic acid. And then when our patients uh, go to the pharmacy to pick it up, often they'll get counseled again by pharmacists about the black box warning and leading to a lot of fear and uncertainty in patients whether they should start the medication or not. Um, and then lastly, uh, the iPad pharmacies refuse to fill the, the prescription um, leading to multiple callbacks and um, you know, continued heavy menstrual bleeding for patients because of this uh, black box warning. So it really is a challenge and a barrier for our patients in order um, to use this therapy. So looking at the current evidence for use of uh, tranexamic acid and hormonal therapy, Thorn and colleagues did a 2018 uh, Medline PubMed pub and based data research in order to evaluate what evidence was out there about the use of these therapies. So they used the terms tranexamic acid, oral contraceptive, and heavy menstrual bleeding and looked at all publications from 1976 to 2017. And unfortunately, no studies directly addressed the use of tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives. There was one case report found using the combination of therapy in a patient who developed a coronary vessel thrombosis. However, the authors could not conclude that really the causality was from the tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives and that the patient may have experienced coronary vessel thrombosis regardless of the use of those medications. So the authors then looked at other uh, avenues to see if you know, evidence was out there about the use clinically of these two therapies. So in Sweden, tranexamic acid has been available over the counter for over 20 years, and there's been no increased risk of venous thromboembolism observed. A retrospective study of 662 women with thrombosis um, compared to 1,500 controls showed that as we know, combined hormonal contraceptives do increase the VTE risk with an odds ratio of 2.41, but there was no increased risk with tranexamic acid with an odds ratio of 0.55. So the authors of this database search concluded that tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives was safe for most women, um, but their caution should be used and they should be avoided if additional risk factors were present. So risk factors such as obesity, uh, inherited thrombophilia, prior history of VTE, tobacco use, you know, those clinical factors um, should impact whether or not it should be used um, in these patients. So a recent uh, uh, presentation at ISTH in 2021 uh, described a retrospective study that was performed in the United Kingdom looking specifically at uh, women with bleeding disorders and who were treated with tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives. So this study included 87 women, and then the median age was 20 to 29 years, but uh, the range extended from 10 to 54 years of age. And it included overweight and obese patients and actually had 26% of the patients in the study uh, meeting those criteria. They did not have patients who had a family history of thrombosis, and the median duration of therapy for these patients uh, was four years and almost 40% had used uh, hormonal therapy and training examinic acid for over five years. And in this study, 89% of those patients rated the treatment as effective, and there was no venous thromboembolism reported. So what are we doing here currently in the United States? As uh, we know from that database search, you know, there is not published evidence in the United States using training examinic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives in females with bleeding disorders. So there was a practice pattern survey of clinician members at the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Research Society and Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders looking at the use of tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives. So 224 uh, practitioners responded and 214 of those responded that they treated patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. And 68% of uh, responders said that they treated at least one patient with antifibrinolytics and combined hormonal contraceptives. And 57% of the survey responders thought that that combination treatment had resolved the heavy menstrual bleeding in at least half of their patients. And there was only one reported arterial or venous thrombotic event, which unfortunately the authors were unable to provide additional details regarding that event. 
So looking at adolescents with bleeding disorders and their treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, looking back at the same study from my institution, 25 of 32 of the patients who failed the initial therapy with combined hormonal contraceptives alone mostly were then treated with a combination of hormonal and non-hormonal therapy. And in that group, 66% reported control of heavy menstrual bleeding. An additional study looked at 34 adolescent patients referred for heavy menstrual bleeding and then diagnosed with bleeding disorders. And in those uh, patients, 24 were treated with combined hormonal contraceptives alone. And the failure rate, again, is very similar. Even though these are small uh, studies, uh, they seem to produce consistent results that uh, first-line therapy is often ineffective. And in this study, 58% of those patients failed. They did not evaluate tranexamic acid monotherapy, but did have 13 patients that were treated with tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives. Unfortunately, the study was not powered to compare in, uh, individual therapies against each other for efficacy, um, but they did say overall treatment um, in that group, 100% achieved menstrual suppression. So all of those 13 patients uh, reported control of their heavy menstrual bleeding using combination therapy, and this was just statistically significant. So then looking at a study out of the United Kingdom, uh, 42 patients who were aged 12 to 19 years were treated at a multidisciplinary clinic for heavy menstrual bleeding and bleeding disorders in the United Kingdom. Um, and in the United Kingdom, in this study, the tranexamic acid uh, was most commonly used. So 98% of their female patients were on tranexamic acid. And in about a third of those patients, their heavy menstrual bleeding was actually controlled uh, by tranexamic acid alone. Then 19 of 42 of the patients, or 45%, were on combined hormonal therapy and tranexamic acid. Um, this study could not compare the efficacy of each treatment modality, but did overall feel that treatment was effective and reduced PBAC scores from 215 to 88, and also the quality of life improvement scores were statistically significant. So I think all of these studies point out that we don't know what works best in these patients. So in our patients with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding, we have a lot of treatments to offer, and we often start with combined hormonal contraceptives uh, with or without the addition of tranexamic acid or tranexamic acid alone as first-line therapy. And unfortunately, even though these studies are all relatively small in number, they seem to consistently show us that uh, these patients fail first-line treatment, whether that's with com combination hormonal contraceptive um, or TXA alone. Although the use of TXA alone has not really been evaluated thoroughly in these patients. And so that, you know, that really leads to the question of how can we improve our consistent standard of care for these patients? And how can we uh, evaluate whether using combined hormonal therapy and tranexamic acid really is the most effective way to control bleeding, but is also safe for our patients as, you know, really all the evidence suggests that it is. So this leads me to my next steps. So um, protested research needs to be uh, performed to evaluate the efficacy and safety of tranexamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives in bleeding disorder patients. And so the two studies that uh, I am proceeding with to evaluate this starts with a retrospective study to really gain baseline information. So this is the combat recon study, so combination therapy in adolescents to treat heavy menstrual bleeding. This is a retrospective multi-center study uh, supported by the Foundation for Women and Girls with Bleeding Blood Disorders to evaluate treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescents with bleeding disorders. So this will be a study that combines uh, a lot of retrospective data I and mean, really will have much more information than the individual single center studies have provided. Um, we can have baseline data about you know, the treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding in these girls, what has been effective in the past, what has been used, um, any safety events or adverse events from using com combination therapy, um, impact of quality of life and mental health can be looked at and really um, provide this baseline data so that we can move forward um, to figuring out next steps uh, to treat these girls. And that leads to my last uh, slide and, and my passion project. So this is the combat heavy menstrual bleeding study, um, which I, you know, once I have my retrospective study complete, look forward to embarking on. And this will be a multi-center randomized controlled trial that will look at the use of training stamic acid versus training stamic acid and combined hormonal contraceptives um, as randomized arms to really get perspective data about how we treat uh, girls with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding. 
in order to establish standard of care and reduce first line failure treatment so that we can improve quality of life for these patients. And these are just my references. So I'm happy to take any questions at this time and appreciate you all bearing with me with the, uh, my technical difficulties. I think the two screens was a, a little off for my uh, presentation, but hopefully it came across okay. It was perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Amos. Excellent presentation. Nice studies that you're planning. Very important pieces of information that we really need to have in order to make sure that uh, you know, we understand and do a better job of managing our patients. Um, I have a question for you. So um, in the retrospective studies, were there any, was there any consideration given to the severity of a bleeding disorder and the need for a combination uh, therapy? And in your prospective study, are you looking at this? I don't know that you can have a score for severity, whether it's going to be a bad score that's higher or whether it's a type of bleeding disorder. I think both would be significant and important to know in order to be able to understand if we have to fail therapy before we give combination therapy, or can we um, a priori based on information that you collect in your studies have a way of knowing that this is the type of, uh, this is a score, or you can create a score, I guess, so that you can then decide if you, if you have such and such a score, then you would benefit from combination versus having to fail a single therapy before you go on combination. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that that is an excellent point. I think that, uh, Unfortunately, all of the, the single-centered retrospective studies that have looked at this didn't have enough patients um, included to really be able to tease out those nuances. So, you know, it was, it was patients with all bleeding disorder. So, you know, it was, and it didn't separate or sub, some analyze by type of bleeding disorder just because the numbers were so low. And so that's why I feel like you like getting a, um, a large multi-center retrospective study where we could really analyze which patients, you know, our platelet function disorder patients versus our vulvalibran patients versus our mild hemophilia patients, and then kind of, you know, really inform the prospective trial of using things like that severity bleeding type um, to set up success, I think it is, is why moving, I've moved in that direction and I'm studying the studies. That's a very good point. Um, I have a question from Laura Guzba from Henry Ford. She asks, what dose of tranexamic acid do you plan to use in your study? So um, I would use the standard dosing of the 1300 milligrams TID uh, for patients as, as long as the weight uh, criteria was met. Yeah, but your study is going to be primarily in adolescents, right? Not adult women. Correct, correct. Yes, I'm specifically looking at uh, adolescents. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Are you also going to look at the additional risk factors? Like you said, would that be a contraindication or L, uh, exclusion criteria for your study? If you were obese, mm -hmm. if you had, I, I can see obesity is the one thing that I'm having a hard time about. I mean, it's easy to say that if you've had a clot, obviously you don't get on the study. How do you define, is there going to be a BMI cutoff? So yeah, I think this this the easy exclusion words are family history of thrombosis, yeah. you know, inherited thrombophilia. Those are easy. Um, I'm hopeful, you know, looking at that United Kingdom data that you know it didn't seem that uh, obesity really affected the rate of thrombosis in those patient populations, and and we know that you know from uh, thrombosis risk really changes with age, and so the adolescents, even who are obese, have a much lower rate than adult women. Um, and so I'm hopeful to tease out from the retrospective study to see, you know, is there really any correlation with BMI or not? Um, and I, I would probably, you know, moving forward, you know, preliminary planning wise, set it with, you know, morbid obesity, because otherwise, unfortunately, the state of, of our country, you know, a lot of our teenagers are overweight. Um, and so I would think that really just doing like morbid obesity would be a reasonable step. Right. Okay. I see Dr. Rajbrooker has a question, and then I have another one for you too. Yeah, Lauren, very nice study. And I think, again, very relevant to uh, the adolescent young girls. But um, my question is, do you think that rather than randomize, would a crossover design be helpful in terms of A, decreasing the number of patients and then also trying to sort of control and uh, for their, the patients for themselves? You know, Because there's going to be a very wide variety of patients that you treat. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering if that's a possibility. 
I think, yeah, you know, we've gone to, uh, back and forth about crossovers, massive crossover and things like that. And I think, you know, uh, it, we may still end up there just given the fact of those points that you raised. And so um, I don't think that that has been completely ruled out. Um, and as we plan, you know, really want to do the randomized control trial in the most thoughtful way possible. Um, and, and that is an excellent point. Excellent. So the next question is the from Dr. Nirja Swaminathan. She says, nice talk. Would you also be looking at exposure to tranexamic acid in elective surgery or trauma in patients who may have been on COCs for menses? We would really only be looking at the use of it in our bleeding disorder population, so not looking at those, those patients. Although I think that that is a, a nice study idea that, that should be looked at, um, <laughs> uh, but not specifically in the study. Got it. Yeah. But I think the majority is, this is the most common situation in which the com right. the combo is used. So this right. would most likely be a minority. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Uh, so we will move on to our next presenter, who's going to be Dr. Nirja Swaminathan. And she's going to talk to us today about age and hemophilia carrier phenotype. Dr. Swaminathan is a clinical instructor in pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Michigan, pursuing an academic career path in hemostasis and thrombosis. Following her medical degree from Kilpock Medical College in India, she completed her residency at Brookdale University Hospital Medical Center and then did her fellowship at the University of Iowa. Her current research focuses on studying the clinical and laboratory phenotype of hemophilia carriers. So Dr. Swaminathan's goal is to improve outcomes for women and girls with bleeding and clotting disorders through research. As an educator, she's engaged in teaching pediatric residents and fellows. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, for uh, giving us this talk today. And we're looking forward to hear about your study. Uh, we're not able to hear you. Nirja, you're muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Chitlor and uh, the NHF uh, for um, allowing me to present my current research on uh, hemophilia carriers. So um, this is a project that is uh, funded by the uh, Athen and uh, the HDRS uh, Dream Award uh, 2020. And uh, we designed this project um, when I was um, at the University of Iowa. And uh, as um, Dr. Chidler introduced, I'm currently affiliated with the University of Michigan. Um, okay. So I'll start off by giving a little background about um, prior epidemiological studies that have been done in the field of women and girls with bleeding disorders. Um, so as um, previously, um, pointed out in some of the other talks, including Dr. James's talk and a couple of the others, um, over the last couple of decades, um, there has been increasing uh, number of studies and a growing body of evidence showing that um, women and girls with bleeding disorders experience substantial morbidity and uh, most of it related to reproductive tract bleeding and in general obstetric and gynecologic morbidity. Um, so this female UDC project is um, is a study that was published in Hemophilia in 2011. And uh, it was, so UDC stands for Universal Data Collection. And uh, it was actually the first um, female focused surveillance effort where they retrospectively looked at um, all women and girls over two years of age that have um, received care at uh, HDCs or hemophilia treatment centers in the United States. Um, so there was an, another study which was published in um, 2013 in the same journal Hemophilia that showed that um, there was a very significant increase in the, when they looked at um, 
20 years between 1990 and 2010, they found a dramatic increase in the percentage of women that were cared for at HDCs in the US. Again, suggesting that um, women uh, bleed as well. Um, so, and in the most recent study that I have cited here, um, it is actually relevant because I will also be looking at the Athen data set. And this was um, published in 2020 in the Journal of Women's Health. And um, I think this was by Christina Haley from Oregon. And they looked at um, the entire spectrum and uh, they looked at um, the characteristics and the bleeding phenotype of all women and girls with uh, bleeding disorders. And this study also found that women and girls comprised about 24.5% of the entire data set and uh, BWD was the most common diagnosis. So I do wanna point out here that 24.5% of the entire data set actually, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of an underestimation, um, but one of the main conclusions from the authors was that um, this data source compared to other previous data sources that have been looked at in this regard, um, there may have been um, lapses with data collection and um, entry. So from all of this, um, is when we looked at the um, individual bleeding disorders that were part of all these studies, um, carriers of hemophilia have been um, underrepresented in all of these surveillance efforts. And we uh, found that uh, disease-specific um, studies are needed to better characterize the phenotype of this population. So this brings us to um, hemophilia carriers. And uh, this slide was um, part of Dr. James's talk as well. So this, I wanna start off by um, mentioning briefly about the new nomenclature for hemophilia carriers. So the newly proposed nomenclature, um, and which was published this year in JTH is that instead of putting everybody under the umbrella term of hemophilia carriership, um, we would um, we should be dividing them based on number one, based on their levels, factor levels, and number two, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. So based on their levels, if they're less than 40%, obviously, um, so that becomes the same as um, hemophilia, which is um, so mild, moderate, and severe, women and girl with mild, moderate, and severe hemophilia. And if they are, um, if their levels are more than 40%, um, then we look um, closely at the bleeding phenotype and if, whether they are um, symptomatic or asymptomatic hemophilia carrier. And moving on to talk about um, what do we know so far in bleeding, about bleeding in hemophilia carriers. So it has been um, underscored in multiple studies that um, hemophilia carriers experience um, significant bleeding tendencies and uh, leading, and this leads to poor quality of life as a consequence of that. Um, this was, so the first study um, that I have cited here is as early as um, 1951. So there was um, attention that was drawn to this patient population, um, you know, in an effort to um, better define the female carrier of hemophilia. And also to not only just to, you know, clinic to know, understand better as to clinically, how do they bleed? And number two, whether whether there are, um, you know, there is one test that can be um, done to diagnose a carrier. Um, so, and then there, um, there have been also studies that have been, that have shown that um, carriers experience a wide spectrum of bleeding manifestations, not just um, nose bleeding or gum bleeding, but a variety. And it has also been shown by a couple of different studies that um, factor levels, both eight and nine, does not necessarily correlate with the bleeding phenotype. And putting all of these together, so we know that the bleeding phenotype of carriers has not been um, studied across their entire lifespan. Um, so most of the prior um, clinical studies have focused on um, women in the reproductive age, um, whereas we don't exactly know how, you know, how they behave um, on both ends of the spectrum, um, the younger ones as well as the um, uh, older patients, postmenopausal, and um, things like that. 
So moving on to talk a little bit about what we know about um, age and how it impacts the carrier phenotype. Um, so we know from prior multiple studies that um, fat rate levels um, in healthy individuals um, is something that is known to vary with um, BMI, um, fibrinogen, with CRP levels, and with um, blood groups, as we know that it is an acute phase reactant. Um, however, um, there was one prior study published in um, 2010 in hemophilia where um, they looked at factor rate levels in uh, non-carriers versus um, carriers of hemophilia A. Um, this study was only A, they did not look at B, and they found that um, in, in general, the observation was that whatever uh, factors, um, the BMI, CRP, fibrinogen, and blood groups that have been known to influence factor levels in non-carriers or healthy patients um, does not um, influence factor levels in carriers. Um, although it did find, which something that is you know, previously known that the factor levels tend to run lower in um, carriers of hemophilia, but um, factor levels in carriers um, varied only with um, PTT and with uh, VWF antigen and VWF activity levels. In addition to this, um, I also want to point out that there is um, lack of understanding about um, how age influences um, factor nine levels because there, it has not been studied so far in carriers of hemophilia B. So essentially this brings us um, to a knowledge gap that um, bleeding uh, phenotype and factor levels have not been stud studied in carriers across the entire lifespan. So coming on to the last um, aim of our study, and I'll go over um, you know, what our specific aims are in just a little bit. Um, so we want to look at um, treatment trends. So and how we got to that is because, um, so we all know that the MASAC or the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council of the NHF uh, recommends treating hemophilia carriers with um, hemostatic therapies and factor concentrates, especially the ones with um, factor levels less than 50% uh, perinatally in labor and delivery, um, and if they are bleeding or if they are going to undergo any other surgery. Um, and this was in 2016. And um, following this recommendation, we did not exactly have data that shows the um, shows how we're doing and data on uh, trends of prescription and trends of utilization of hemostatic therapies and hemophilia carriers. So this brings us to our um, study question, um, which is to investigate the age-dependent variation of the clinical and lab phenotype, along with uh, prescription trends of hemostatic therapies in hemophilia carriers in the United States in the last decade from 2010 through 2020. So our um, individual aims of this study are um, number one, so to enrich the Athen data set through an internal audit of data on hemophilia carriers at all of the participating hemophilia treatment centers. And number two, it is to study the age dependent variation of the clinical and um, lab phenotype of hemophilia carriers. And number three is to study the longitudinal trend of um, prescription of factor concentrates and other hemostatic therapies in hemophilia carriers from um, 2010 to 2020. So we have four centers involved. Um, IOIHTC, um, the primary center, has, um, so uh, these numbers are approximate, they're not exact, but they're it's roughly this many. Um, at Iowa, we um, have 40 of um, carriers of A and 60 of carriers of B, um, and mainly the it's the Amish population that contributes to uh, a high number of um, nine carriers. Um, and these patients are um, followed at the HDC in um, the interval in which they are seen is not um, consistent, but um, they're followed regularly at the HTC. Um, 
And then Rochester HTC, um, I think they have um, 40 and 10 of A's and B's and Michigan State has uh, 40 and 10 again and the University of Michigan has about 30 and 10 of A's and B's. So I wanna just um, talk a little bit about um, the Athen data set and what that is and um, what that contains and how it would actually help us answer our study question. Um, so it's a robust surveillance tool for um, patients with bleeding disorders um, to conduct epidemiological studies to understand um, the characteristics of one specific patient population. Um, so currently, um, and this is, uh, this data is obtained from the Athen um, biostatistics um, person. And um, currently the data set has data on um, 1,566 uh, females with uh, factor eight deficiency and 474 females with factor nine deficiency. So in the data set, um, they don't have the term um, carrier. So factor eight deficiency also includes um, patients who have a normal factor level. Um, it, it's kind of um, confusing in terms of um, how it sounds like. It sounds like only women and girls with hemophilia, but um, it also includes um, uh, patients who are who have completely no bleeding and have a normal factor level and, the, and otherwise as well. Um, and this data set has uh, the unique capability to capture um, the bleeding symptoms, factor levels, and the treatment trends in um, hemophilia carriers. So that brings us to um, an overview of the uh, methods that we are um, in the process of um, doing. So we began the study in uh, June. So, um, so it is, we're in the third month of data collection. Um, the first step obviously is IRB approval at each of the participating HDCs. Um, so initially after IRB approval, we're starting off with um, retrospective review of the patient charts. Um, and parallelly, we review um, how much of that data is entered in the Athen clinical manager. And um, whatever missing data elements we find, we develop a plan um, that would be implemented in all of the collaborating HDCs. Um, we develop a plan to enter those missing data elements into the Athen Clinical Manager, thereby enriching the Athen data set, uh, which is our first aim. And then the data that we find by um, review of the patient charts will be entered, um, is being entered into um, an online uh, REDCap database, um, which will then be analyzed. So um, there are four different forms um, that we have um, for through which we are uh, collecting data on REDCap. Uh, the first form is um, demographics, um, and that's in, that includes variables like um, race, ethnicity, um, whether uh, they have a medicolored bracelet, the um, age and um, date of birth, and uh, variables like that. And um, the second form is um, about their clinical bleeding characteristics. And the third form is about surgeries. And the fourth form is about lab characteristics. Um, under clinical um, data, we are looking into all the specific um, details about every single bleed that they have had. Um, so if it is um, nose bleed, then we're collecting data about um, the bleed uh, type, the um, laterality, the what provoked it, whether it is um, seasonal or um, whether the patient has undergone nasal cauterization, um, whether they've been treated, uh, what kind of hemostatic therapy they have used uh, and whether they have ever gotten factor concentrate um, and um, so forth. And we're also um, collecting, if documented, um, we're collecting um, data um, about uh, bleed scores. Um, and the third form is looking into um, data about uh, surgeries. So there uh, we're uh, 
the data that we're collecting is essentially the type of surgery, the type of anesthesia, and whether they got any treatment prior to administration of anesthesia, and whether and what kind of hemostatic therapies they got around perioperatively. Um, and the fourth form, looking into um, laboratory characteristics, um, so we are going to be uh, collecting factor levels, um, factor eight, as well as factor nine levels, and across the lifespan. So how many ever times um, in, this is case by case, it differs from patient to patient, depending on how much they bleed and how much they actually follow regularly and uh, multiple other factors. Um, but essentially the goal to answer how the factor levels vary with ages. So we're looking at how many other times um, it has been collected. And then we're also gonna be um, collecting variables like um, one willibrand factor, one willibrand um, antigen as well as activity, um, and also blood groups um, to see how that correlates. So coming to the um, project timeline and where we are, so we're right now in the first um, three months and uh, we're in the process of doing an internal audit and uh, a couple of the centers, we're in the process of wrapping up our IRB approval and uh, data collection has um, somewhat um, been completed at um, Iowa and uh, the other centers um, because I wanted to complete it before I left Iowa. And then um, at the other centers, we are uh, wrapping up the audit and then uh, we'll still slowly be um, starting data collection. And uh, so that'll be the next three months and then analysis and then manuscript preparation. So it's a project of one year. And what we hope to achieve with this is that um, we hope to get um, data about the changing patterns of management of bleeding in hemophilia carriers. And uh, we hope to identify um, the current gaps in data collection. Um, and with that, we hope to, um, for the future, we hope to optimize the clinical management and improve the outcomes of hemophilia carriers through um, hopefully generation of um, evidence-based guidelines specific to this patient population. I would like to thank um, the HDRS and Athen teams um, for the Dream Award funding. And uh, I am beyond grateful to my uh, mentors for this project, which is Dr. Shirat Kumar and uh, Dr. Koides from Rochester and uh, collaborating, everybody from the collaborating um, hemophilia treatment centers, which is um, University of Michigan and MSU. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Very nice study. And uh, we look forward to the data that you're going to collect. Uh, let me see if there's any questions. If not, I have one. Um, so this is actually from when I was, uh, it's, it, it's not necessarily just a retrospective. It is retrospective, but you're collecting data. It is data retrospective. Over, right? It's data yep. over time. So it's not just a one-time point data collection. No. No. So each patient will be followed over a period of time. Do you have yes. a fixed range of time that you're going to be following these patients for or whatever is available is what you're going to take? Whatever. So when we look at um, every patient, um, we, as you said, it's not just one point of time, but how much ever um, they have data they have so far. Um, and going forward, I guess, until the period of, the one year, um, how much ever data we can get. Do you happen to know approximately what the age group is of this patient population that you're going to collect data on, at least from your IOVA sample size? It's, um, so there is no age limit. Um, so in Iowa, from the patients that I have already collected data, there is as young as three years old um, who could be an obligate carrier. And um, as old as I think I had somebody in 70s. Um, so it's uh, throughout the age spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because I was wondering if... Um... You need you need length of time for this, right? It, yeah, it will make a difference if you uh, if you if somebody started at seventeen and went through twenty four, you're not sure if you're going to see a change. Whereas yeah. you only went from three to seven again, you're not going to see a change. You really yeah. need somebody who goes from three to like fifty. Yeah, 
maybe. I know that's Absolutely. to ask for, but uh, yep. so prospective study would probably be the best way to do this, Absolutely. right? To, to Absolutely. Collect this information, yeah. but it's good to start with retrospective mm -hmm. data in order for you to plan for a prospective study. Yeah. So what got you interested in this top, in this uh, study? How did you come up to design the study and where do you see this going? So, um, so I um, got excited about hemoph the specific patient population because we see a lot of Amish population who are carriers in um, Iowa. And uh, so I have been exposed to the outreach clinic that we do um, there, which is once every, uh, sometimes one every one year or one and a half to two years. Um, so it's, I, I just, thought that it, this is a patient population where much more needs to be understood as well as um, they deserve much more. So um, that's what got me interested. And as far as um, I hope to take it further in terms of, as we said, hopefully something prospective after which might give us more um, information. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Nirja. That was uh, thank you so wonderful. much. We will move on to our next speaker, who is going to be Dr. Megan Brown. So, Dr. Megan Brown is going to talk to us today about heavy menstrual bleeding evaluation and management optimization. She is a pediatric hematologist focusing on the care of children and adolescents with bleeding disorders at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. She completed her medical school at Michigan State University and her residency at University of Colorado and Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship at Emory. Dr. Brown was the recipient of the NHF Takeda Clinical Fellowship Award in 2019, and her research centers on optimizing diagnosis and treatment of girls and young women with inherited bleeding disorders. Thank you for presenting here today and looking forward to your presentation. I'm Nirja, glad to be here. Sharing. There you go. All right. Well, thank you all for having me and for that kind introduction. I'm excited to talk to you all today about um, a study that we're working on called the EQUIP study um, that's really focused on optimizing treatment, but also um, getting more information about how to evaluate our adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and our objectives for today's presentation are to review a little bit of the data on heavy menstrual bleeding um, laboratory evaluation and treatment in adolescents, which I'm sure you've heard some already about today, and then talk about our EQUIP study. So heavy menstrual bleeding, as we know, is common in adolescents and reported in almost up to 40% of adolescents if looked cross-sectionally, cross um, and affects many areas of the life other than just the amount of blood loss, um, which as pediatricians, this is really important to us. Um, particularly school absenteeism is um, present in over 50% of girls with heavy menstrual bleeding, which um, they're typically missing one or more days per cycle. So over the course of their academic career, that's a significant amount of time. Um, outside of the classroom, social and athletic events are often skipped, as well as physical education. We see concurrent iron deficiency and fatigue. So all things that can be very challenging in this important time in, in a girl's life. So looking particularly at, at adolescents, um, bleeding disorders are one of the top two reasons um, for heavy menstrual bleeding, along with hormonal kind of immaturity of the um, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis um, and anovulation. And so as hematologists, we're an important part of um, the puzzle in diagnosing and treating these girls. And the laboratory evaluation that's recommended for adolescents is very similar to the one of adults. And for a long time, um, all that we had was the recommendations from the adult consensus statements. But within the last couple of years, um, ACOG, which is the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as a group from ISTH has come together to really figure out, um, at least from an expert panel perspective, what should we be doing to evaluate adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding? And collectively looking at all of these guidelines, they're pretty similar um, in terms of the coagulation evaluation and getting basic coags, including fibrinogen activity or thrombin time, von Willebrand studies, looking at thyroid studies and ferritin, um, and then considering um, looking at the hormonal 
abnormalities that can be present with PCOS, depending on if there are signs of PCOS physically. Bleeding disorders are common in our population, um, and we've a recent paper has found that um, about 33% of those referred to a hematologist and seen there um, are found to have a bleeding disorder. Um, but doing figuring out the optimal timing of this laboratory evaluation is still challenging. Our group saw um, in girls with acute heavy menstrual bleeding that von Willebrand factor and factor eight levels can be in, um, elevated significantly. Um, so upfront testing during acute bleeding can be skewed. And then oftentimes given the associated symptoms of menstrual cycles, um, girls have often taken medications that would affect platelet function, making upfront testing for that as being challenging as well. So most commonly platelet dysfunction and von Willebrand's disease are what we're seeing. Um, so that is what makes um, these particular challenges most important. But we also do see factor deficiencies such as factor eight and factor 11 um, showing up in our girls with heavy menstrual bleeding. When switching up to looking at treatment efficacy in adolescents with bleeding disorders, there's pretty limited data um, looking at each study and tip or at each treatment type and typically is single institution um, retrospective studies or, or larger retrospective studies or single institution prospective studies. Um, intrauterine devices that release progesterone are anecdotally a favorite among both gynecologists and hematologists. Um, and looking at particularly bleeding disorders I mean, adolescents, um, one paper found that all girls had improvement in bleeding and from a laboratory perspective, their anemia and ferritin improved with a decreased need for secondary agents. Combined oral contraceptives, which have been the mainstay of treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding for decades, um, are also frequently utilized in this population. In one study that looked particularly at, at type one von Willebrand's disease, the vast majority had a decrease in their PBAC score, which is, is a tool that monitors um, and quantifies bleeding amount. Um, DDAVP and von Willebrand's disease um, can also be used, um, which has a significant amount who have a decrease in menstrual bleeding, but also has known side effects and over time can become less effective. And then tranexamic acid, um, the antifibrinolytic, um, is also shown some promise in improving um, bleeding in girls with heavy menstrual bleeding. But not many of these studies have looked at these in a comparative sense and looking at, at these across populations um, or across all of our different types of bleeding disorders. We've also found in a review of our patients and our young women's bleeding clinic that the vast majority of girls will require a change in therapy in order to achieve adequate menstrual control. And um, although the graphs seem somewhat similar in terms of the combined oral contraceptives are the most common and are still the largest piece of the pie and when a girl reached what they considered to be effective or effective therapy, however, um, the vast majority did change at some point in time with the median needing two different therapies and some girls needing up to five different therapies before they felt that they had achieved adequate menstrual control. And so it's definitely not a one size fits all um, type of treatment strategy. And we're all still learning about what are the best choices for girls up front. All of these questions led myself and a group of researchers through the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders to want to look into this more. Um, and so we designed the EQUIP study, um, which is looking at evaluating the quality of life in period treatment. That's how we came up with EQUIP, um, which is a prospective observational study looking at um, comparative effectiveness of um, Heavy, of different treatments for heavy menstrual bleeding. So our overall objective is to characterize both quantitative blood loss and quality of life in adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding um, before and after starting therapy. And this is um, any therapy that they have chosen along with their provider, we're not assigning these therapies um, and use statistical analysis to do comparative effectiveness of the different treatments. This has been funded graciously by the Hemophilia of Georgia, um, who is helping us to get this off the ground. So we are looking at comparing different groups of therapies, including combined oral contraceptives and progesterone-based methods, antifibrinolytic therapies, such as tranexamic acid and aminocaproic acid, and intrauterine devices um, in the treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, we are um, also collecting data on less commonly used therapies um, such as factor infusions, 
um, DDAVP, et cetera. Um, but just in terms of the primary analysis, um, we are using what our uh, participating sites use most commonly. Um, AIM-1A, which is what we're focusing on, is using a patient reported outcome um, of quality of life of the MIQ-1. And so if you're un, um, unfamiliar with the Menaraja Impact Questionnaire, um, it's a very simple, quick quality of life and disease specific tool to help us follow over time how girls are um, believing that their uh, menstrual bleeding is changing. So this um, MIQ-1 is the first question. Um, and they just rate that your most recent period, your blood loss was light, moderate, heavy, or very heavy, and are gonna use this over time in order to determine if that is an impactful change for girls after starting a medication. Secondly, we'll quantify the amount of blood loss using the PBAC. And then we will also look at secondary qual quality of life scores as well, as I feel like this is an important area um, to quantify in our adolescent population and has been relatively unreported um, in a large scale in the literature. Secondarily, um, we want to understand a little bit more about what um, girls are experiencing with their heavy menstrual bleeding. And we're gonna collect information to understand why girls are discontinuing certain treatments um, and they'll rate um, effectiveness of previous therapies. Um, we'll try to determine how many um, different therapies were needed before they achieve adequate bleeding control, and also to characterize what bleeding um, evaluation was being done in our adolescents, as we will be enrolling girls who already have a diagnosis and are undergoing evaluation, as you'll see on the next slide. So there are two um, arms to this study, a fully prospective study, um, or fully prospective arm, which will be um, new patients being evaluated for a bleeding disorder, um, who are starting therapy, and then the semi-prospective arm um, for those who already have been diagnosed with an inherited bleeding disorder and have had a recent start on a therapy. Um, and we're doing that in order to ensure that we're having an adequate number um, with the bleeding disorder to power the study. Um, but the, the prospective arm we believe is really important in order to get um, accurate data about the, the symptoms and the bleeding prior to therapy. Um, and also just to see from this um, large cohort of investigators focused on young women's waiting, what type of waiting evaluation is felt to be warranted. Um, and we'll, we'll collect all of that data um, on each girl who is being evaluated. We're um, including girls up to the age of 21 after discussions with gynecologists. And they thought that that would be um, kind of a, an age in terms of the physiology starting to be considered to change. Um, and we're doing these at um, pediatric centers. And then for those who have been on therapy for a prolonged period of time, um, we will not study um, and have too much bias from their retrospective memory. Um, we are going to have 14 sites from around the continental United States, who I believe have a wide variety of racial and ethnic diversity, um, geographical diversity, um, and treatment diversity in terms of the providers treating them. So hopefully that will help us to have a well-rounded sample um, of individuals across the country. We're focusing on patient-centered outcomes. And so as you see here, um, a variety of surveys will be collected and they'll be collected longitudinally, um, both, both at baseline at three to, to eight months and then nine to 15 months. And the reason that the ranges are so broad is that if they are having a visit within any of that time frame, we wanna make sure we capture um, girls anytime that they're seeing their hematologist and follow up. Um, but if they are not in the clinic, these will be emailed to them um, in order to collect data over time. In red, all of these different surveys in the red cap are patient reported, um, which I think is important to get their perspective rather than putting our perceived changes on them. Um, looking specifically in the blue, we have different um, thoughts about why they're choosing medications um, and then their current menstrual bleeding treatment as they're moving forward if it changes. And right below it, there's a provider treatment choice that will also help us to understand which um, treatments were offered to them and why. Secondly, we'll get bleeding symptoms with a self-bat and a PBAC. And lastly, we have quality of life um, surveys with the MIQ as well as fatigue specific scoring as that is known to affect girls with heavy menstrual bleeding 
In terms of our current progress, we're approved at I, our IRB and working with several participating IRBs to um, have approval there. And our contract was just executed at, at our primary site this week, which we're very excited and hope to start enrolling in the next one to two months. I think some strengths of this study is that it's the largest study looking at comparative treatment effectiveness in this population. And we'll get a, a very robust amount of treatment choice, uh, about a treatment information from providers and um, subjects combined. Um, and then that will help us to classify what workup is um, being currently done um, to help us to determine um, which truly is necessary. So I'm grateful for all of the people um, who have been helpful in getting this off the ground. It's been years in the making um, and I'm excited to answer any questions that you have. Excellent presentation, wonderful study. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we don't necessarily pay attention to quality of life. Uh, we are usually more interested in measuring things that we can do in the lab. And uh, I think we pay less attention to things that actually make a difference to the patient. And I think this study will answer that and uh, will be a great uh, piece of, uh, you know, it, it will be wonderful information that is, will truly define why we need to do what we're doing. It's not mm -hmm. only what we're doing, I think why is an important question and thank you for doing this wonderful study. So mm -hmm. how long is your study over, Megan? So each individual subject will be followed over about 12 to 15 months um, from the time of enrollment um, in order to get these three time points. Um, we're anticipating keeping the enrollment open for about four years um, in order to get that time frame. Um, our funding is for, for four years right now with potential extension. And so um, I think that that's a feasible amount of time to recruit 500, which in the adult world, I know a lot of you who live in the adult world think that that's a small study, but for pediatrics, this is, is a lot to try to get going. And so um, I'm hopeful though, because we've got some really good people working together. Very nice, very nice. What made you come up with this question? So this honestly started from a, a PCORI project, which is patient-centered outcomes research. Um, and we were doing something similar um, with that project and we did some focus groups from with teenagers and young adults um, with von Willebrand's disease and uh, hemophilia carries just a variety of bleeding disorders and hearing them talk about the struggle of um, kind of being heard and finding the right treatment and how it took years and even decades for them to feel like they were um, getting anywhere. Um, it made me really try to think of how can we design research that focuses on what they care about. And they were talking about school absenteeism and being embarrassed to be about, around their friends. And I just find that to be something that um, we can do a better job of. And, and I really enjoy kind of the, how can we make people's lives better um, through medicine? And, and I think we're able to do that. Excellent, excellent, very nice. I have a question for you. Uh, it says, for the girls who are evaluated and do not end up having a bleeding disorder, are they still followed or do they come off your study with negative diagnosis? Um, we're planning to follow them all the way through. Um, and the reason being, I think that we could get some really interesting information um, to use as essentially our own internal control group. Um, because we've already kind of done all the legwork to get them enrolled. And after that first visit, really all the surveys can be done virtually. Um, so it's, it's not a whole lot of work. And I think it would be important information to gain to even see if there are differences between um, the way that people respond to treatments or their quality of life changes, depending on bleeding disorder diagnosis. Because I think some of the girls that we see who don't end up having bleeding disorder diagnosis have horrible quality of life as well. So we're planning to follow all of them that same time period. I think it'll be very interesting because I think there was a quality of life study in hemophilia where they compared quality of life in patients who had inhibitors and didn't have inhibitors. And actually what they found was that the patients who had inhibitors had a better quality of life from what mm -hmm. they mentioned. And I think the thought process or the way the discussion in the paper was, was that the expectations were different. If you had inhibitors, you sort of expected that your quality of life was going to be terrible. So how the patients, you know, responded to the questions, 
indicated that they didn't have as bad a quality of life because their expectations were different from those who didn't. So I think mm -hmm. it would be very interesting to see if you come, you see the similar thing, if you, your patients with breathing disorders ultimately end up reporting a better quality of life than others only because they, their expectations are different. So that I thought is- Yeah, really or they had- yeah, that's really interesting. Or how having a reason for something sometimes makes it easier rather than still being told there's nothing wrong with you and suffering nonetheless. So that, that's an interesting question. It will, it'll be interesting to see how all that plays yeah. out. I wonder, I don't know how you would ask the question to see if that plays a role, but that's it's just an interesting thought. So mm -hmm. it is. very good. If anybody else has any questions, please let me know. And if the panelists uh, can turn on their cameras, if they're still here, if there's any questions that we can address at this point of time, we'd be happy to do that. If anybody in the audience has any questions, please let us know. If not, I would like to conclude the session. And I would like to thank each and every one of our speakers for their excellent and thought provoking presentations today. It's really gratifying for me to see the enthusiasm that all of you have focusing on women and girls with bleeding disorders. And I think this data will really drive uh, the field and ensure that we can improve care for this patient population. I'd like to thank again uh, the organizers at NHF as well as Griffles for providing an avenue to present the work of these researchers and encourage others to pursue research in this field. And uh, before you all leave uh, the audience wise, I wanted to say that tomorrow, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, the NHF medical track um, will uh, le lead off with a great session on international von Willebrand disease guidelines and novel therapies for von Willebrand disease. So I hope everyone can join that uh, session tomorrow. Also uh, for the audience, please check the CME CE tab on the N on NHF's virtual conference site to get additional information about the accredited portions of the medical and allied pro provider tracks. And again, on behalf of NHF, I would like to thank all the speakers for their great presentations and all of you for joining uh, this symposium. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I see a lot of audience as, uh, commenting that it was a great session, terrific presenters, and thanking everyone for the same. And I concur with that. Thank you all. Take care, have a good evening, and hope to see everyone back tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you.